The African wild dog is considered to be Africa's most efficient and successful hunter. With a population of only around 6,500 individuals, or 660 packs, it is also Southern Africa's most rare large carnivore. However, organizations like the African Wildlife Conservation Fund, AWCF, are on a mission to guarantee the survival of this inspiring species. Through their efforts, these dogs, once verging on the brink of local extinction, are making a comeback. It's an incredible experience, something I'll never forget. Wow, this is so special. So we've arrived at the day. Coming up in the series, heart-stopping moments. I can't write, but it's good, it's good, it's good. Thrilling, adrenaline-packed scenes. <laughs> Exhilarating chases. And undocumented wild dog behavior, captured on film from a completely new perspective. Located in Zimbabwe, the Save Valley Conservancy is one of the few remaining vast wildernesses left in Africa. It is a key stronghold for a significant population of wild dogs. Spanning over a million acres, this privately owned reserve boasts a huge variety of habitats and vegetation provides a perfect breeding ground for Africa's largest and smallest species to thrive. The wild dog conservation efforts in the Save Valley Conservancy began in 1996 as the Low Felt Wild Dog Project, monitoring just 36 wild dogs. This work eventually led to the formation of the AWCF and their presence to date has enhanced the protection of the species and the population has increased to over 130 dogs, making it one of the highest densities in the world. So I'm just doing some measurements here. Their work has expanded to include the conservation of other large predators throughout the region due to this success. Now, Ruben, confirm how many pups did you count? Dr. Rosemary Groom and Jess Watermeyer head up operations in the Save Valley with a crew of dedicated scouts specializing in the art of tracking. Together, they form the team responsible for the protection and survival of wild dogs in the Save Valley. The Save Valley Conservancy currently holds 14 resident packs of wild dogs. Throughout this series, we will get to know three of these packs. Splinter's pack formed April of 2010. There are more than 20 dogs in this pack, making them a force to be reckoned with. Mapura pack formed February of 2011. This pack is regarded by some to be the most attractive pack of dogs living within the Conservancy. And last, but by no means least, the Pungui pack. They are the most newly formed pack of the three and are currently preparing for the emergence of their very first litter of pups.
It's late winter, and conservation biologist Dr. Rosemary Groom is on her way to visit the last pack of dogs to den this season. Deep in the Mapani woods, we find the pack relaxing on a bed of fallen leaves that surround the den. Meet the Pungui pack. Okay, so this is the den of the Pungui pack. Um, it's a pack of dogs that only formed in April this year, so April 2015. The, the scouts named the pack. So the Pungui pack is made up of six males and three females. It's six males that we know from another pack called Batanai pack. And they left their natal group in October last year, actually, and started wandering around as a group of five males. They went back to their natal pack in January, February, picked up the other male that was with, that was left with the pack, and, and then as a group of six males, dispersed from their pack and met up with a group of three females, which we know from the Splinters pack. Those three females are only two years old. So now they've formed a pack, and this is their first denning season as the new pack, with two really young first-time mums. It's gonna be quite a, quite a thing for them. It's quite exciting to see what's gonna happen. So for the six males, they're different ages. We've got a, a male called Ten, who was born in 2012, so he's three years old. And then three males, um, Angel, Mask, um, Benguela, um, who's our collared dog, who are all two years old, and then Pod, who's just one. So he was only born last year. And then we've got another one, that the sixth male is a dog called Nuisance. Um, we don't know how old he is. He joined the Batanai pack, where those males came from, randomly in 2013. We have no idea where he came from. And we called him Nuisance because he gave us a lot of trouble. He, he just kept appearing. We didn't know who he was, where he'd come from. We couldn't work out why there was an extra dog in the pack all the time. And he's very plain, he doesn't have clear marking, so he caused us a lot of stress and then was basically a nuisance. So shame, poor guy, the name stuck. So those are the six males. We think 10 is the alpha male from his behavior. Um, and he's also the oldest, so that would make sense. Then the three females are, like I said, from Splinter's group. They're about two years old. They're all two years old. From their behavior at the moment, we suspect Loop is probably the alpha female. Both Loop and Jigsaw became pregnant or looked like they were pregnant. They do have pseudo-pregnancies um, and both are lactating. But from the behavior, we think Loop, uh, Loop is probably the dominant female and, and Jigsaw the subdominant. And then the other female, Bones, is, is just a subordinate female. While Rosemary studies the Pungui pack in the east, researcher Jess Watermeyer is on the lookout for another pack of dogs in the far west. Um, right, so this morning we're, we're out here on the western boundary fence of the Conservancy. We're coming to follow up on one of our, well, what we refer to as sort of our pack. Um, they've always, they've been around for about four or five years. At the start of this year, there were 12 adults, but they had a bit of a disruptive year because their long-standing alpha male and alpha female pair um, broke up. The alpha male was unfortunately, we found him dead, um, unknown cause of death, as we only found his collar. And we, we didn't think that they would actually den this year because it was only Ursula, the alpha female, left with her offspring, so there was no unrelated male and female pair. Um, but then very interestingly, we started noticing a dog that definitely wasn't part of the pack. And when we checked all of our pack records, it turned out to be um, a two-year-old male, Otis, which is from our Mambura pack down in the south of the Conservancy. So we can only assume um, that Otis and Ursula have decided to pair up, um, which is fantastic news for the pack. And um, unfortunately, you know, it's towards the end of the denning season, they've, for some reason or other, decided to come and move outside of the Conservancy and den. So we're just going to go and have a look at the den outside and just check if they're all right. We may or may not see them. You know, hopefully we just at least see that they're there and that they're all right um, and that there hasn't been any disturbances at the den. Okay, so we've arrived at the den. Um, we're not getting 
colour signal anymore and we didn't have we didn't hear any dogs barking or growling at us and we can't see any so we think that the, the adults have all gone off to hunt. Uh, these pups are big enough to be left by themselves so it's actually kind of ideal because it means we can quickly change cameras um, and while the dogs aren't here so we're disturbing them a lot less and then we can maybe pull back get to a bit of a vantage point and see if we can uh, stand by and see if they come back from hunt and if we can get a, a better visual of them. We've seen fresh tracks around, but we, when we look at the den cameras, we, the dogs were only seen uh, last about two days ago. Um, but as I said, they are at the end of their denning season, so what they, a lot of packs tend to do is they will use a den hall for a couple of days, move to another one that's nearby. Um, so they could be doing that at the moment. So Mishik's just gone off to get to a high point and test if he can find signal. And if they are somewhere close by, um, then we might just go and have a look. Um, and if we think there's a you know, it's good, if we think it's a good idea to put another camera up somewhere else, then we'll do that, just so we get a good chance of, of catching them if they're moving between two dens. Um, right, so we've confirmed that the, the pack has in fact moved dens um, at about 100 metres west, um, and they, they do seem a little bit skittish when Mishak um, went in to, to find them and, and walk in on the signal, they sort of darted off a bit. So we, um, we I'm just standing by here and Mishik's just gone off to, to put the cameras up just because he's been coming to the den a lot so the dogs will probably be more used to him. Um, and basically what we'll do is we'll put the cameras up and check in five or six days and hopefully yeah, we'll get some really nice pictures of the puppies before they leave the den. And sure, just looking at this, this view behind me, it's no surprise they chose to, to come and den where they are. It's just fantastic. As the day winds down, cameraman Neil Fairley heads out to follow a large pack of dogs as they prepare for an evening hunt. Okay, here we are. We're uh, on our way to see Splinter's pack. They're the biggest pack in the Conservancy at the moment, about 25 dogs. So fingers crossed this could be a very good opportunity for us to get our first full hunt and takedown on film. Uh, we've been at it for about three weeks now and so far no luck. Uh, we've been charged by Ellie's, we've cut faces, battered, bruised, sweat, tears, blood, everything, and no luck. We, we didn't anticipate it to be this hard. Um, it's definitely not like how you see in a lot of the other documentaries of dogs chasing over long distances and open plains. It's thick, it's tight, it's close compact, there's thorns, there's uh, gullies and rocks and hills, there's elephants, there's lion, there's buffalo, there's rhino. The odds are kind of stacked against us at the moment and we're feeling a little despondent, but um, nevertheless we'll carry on, we'll persevere. Um, new pack of dogs, um, uplifted spirits, uh, we're going to give it our best shot and hope today today is the lucky day. Neil arrives just as the pack is becoming active and beginning their pre-hunt routine. Tensions run high as the dogs move off through the wooded thickets in search of prey. The camera team follows in anticipation. And the chase is on.
And just like that, in a few short minutes, it's all over. Okay, a hell of a lot of excitement today. Um, we've, we've been following with, with Splinter's pack and they've made a kill, but sadly for us, we've nothing on camera. We missed it probably by a matter of seconds, I should think. Um, we may have got a little bit of the feeding, so we'll have a look at the footage when we get back, but um, no successful takedown. Um, but we're encouraged. The dogs have made a successful kill. We're closer than we've ever been before. Um, we're definitely uh, more wounded than we've ever been before, so hopefully the dogs find a, a slightly easier area to hunt in, less thorn trees and bushes, um, and we'll just keep trying. Uh, yeah. Back at the Pungui Den, Rosemary eagerly awaits as the newest members of the Conservancy make their first appearance. So this is really exciting because it's the first time we've come to the Pungui Den when we know the pups have, have emerged. They've been seen out on the camera traps. One of our scouts has seen them. But if we're lucky, this is the first day we'll get to see them. And in fact, the mum's just gone down the den, so if we're really lucky, she might call them out. Let's just watch what she does. There you go, there you go. Did you see that little, little head of a little tiny pup? Sweet man, that's the first time I've seen these pups. Um, they emerged a couple of days ago, but this is the first time we've actually seen them. Just two little ears. Oh, look, 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 look. There's two, two out. Oh my gosh, look at them. Brave little guys. Oh, a little bit nervous. Sweet. Okay, off they go, Mum's calling. Oh, look, more. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Goodness, okay, fifteen. Looks like there's fifteen pups, which is amazing. Wow, phenomenal. All being fed in a very excited heat by the pup. Wow, this is so special. Okay, so really exciting. All 15 pups look healthy. There's no obvious runts or any obvious problems there, although of course it's early days. What's going to be really interesting is whether the, or which of the females is going to be the dominant one in terms of the feeding and, and what's happening, because we're not sure whether this is a single litter. Most likely it's actually two litters. Most likely both Loop and Jigsaw have had puppies, and, and what we're seeing in the 15 is is a is a combined litter is, is both of theirs the reason for saying that is because they're both first-time mums and they don't normally have such a big litter as a first-time mum plus the fact that that both the lactating suggests that it, it's quite likely it's not it's not um, it doesn't mean for sure because females can come into lactation to help an alpha female but I think in this case it may well be that but the, the, there's a combination of of puppies from both jigsaw and loop in this litter so it looks like the pups are about three and a half weeks old. They normally emerge, you normally first see them when they're about two and a half, three weeks old. So these guys emerged a few days ago. So I think they're about three and a half weeks old, all in really good condition. Still um, drinking exclusively milk at this point. Um, so, so suckling only. And then anywhere between about, well, from about five weeks old, they start eating a little bit of meat as well. And then between five and 12 weeks, they'll become completely weaned off the milk and, and be eating the meat. And of course, any pack member can bring back meat for them. So in a couple of weeks, we'll start seeing them eating meat. But for the moment, they're just suckling. And it's lucky that there's two lactating females because 15 pups is an awful lot to try and feed. <laughs> As the pups get older, they leave the den and accompany the pack as they move and hunt throughout the conservancy. At about 12 weeks old, they are now out and about, and Neil links up with Pungui to discuss his filming strategy. Okay, so this afternoon, Kane and I um, are with the Pungui pack, our feature pack in the series, and we're going to try and join them on another evening hunt. So, 
The way we're going to do this is we've, we've chosen to use motorbikes to follow the dogs. Kane here does all of his research from his motorbike and as you can see from how close we are to the dogs, they're, they're completely used to the motorbikes. They, they don't upset the dogs at all. And a lot of the wildlife in the area is also quite used to the sound of motorbikes being around. So our hope is that we won't interfere in the hunt, we won't interfere with the dogs or the prey, um, and they can just carry on as, as they will. Another reason for using the bike is that it's, it's very nimble, it's agile, it's, it's very streamlined, very much like the dogs. So when we're trying to follow the dogs through you know, tight gaps through, in trees and go through riverbeds and up little um, hills and, and down into valleys, the motorbikes can more or less go anywhere the dogs can. So that's another reason why we've chosen to use bikes over any other method. So Kane's been a scout in the Conservancy for quite some time and he's, he's very familiar with the dogs and the area. Kane thinks we can do it, he says it's not going to be easy. So far it hasn't been easy, um, but anyway, we, we, we're going to keep trying and we're going to see what we can do. Now it's just over to the dogs to uh, get hunting and make a kill. dogs get into hunting formation and begin their search for prey. In pursuit, the camera team move into position to capture the action from the ground and the air. It's not long before the pack picks up the scent of potential prey and the hunt shifts up a gear. Okay, we finally, finally done it. We've, we've managed to get the first hunt on film. And here it is, we've got the first kill, all on camera, phenomenal chase. It kind of came out of nowhere. The dogs were chasing wildebeest to begin with, um, which we haven't seen them hunt before, uh, which was exciting, but they kind of turned their attention very quickly to a, a lone adult in Pali who was running by himself. And for the, the pack as big as, as it is um, here, the, it, it just didn't stand a chance. Um, they chased it down, a couple of attempts made at it, but eventually they took it down um, on the other side of this tree here, and we finally got it. I, I'm, I'm ecstatic. I know Kane is, is over the moon. It's been some long hours for us, um, and we can just only hope that this is the first of many to come. Okay, we've also noticed some very interesting things by having witnessed a hunt from beginning to end. Um, by the look of things, it, it kind of seems to be a bit like mayhem when the dogs are hunting. There, there doesn't seem to be too much structure, particularly once they've identified a target. It's just everybody goes for it, and whoever gets there first gets there first. Um, but what we did notice that was interesting that we haven't heard a lot of in, in textbooks and in other documentaries is we, we've witnessed dogs actually 
taking the impala and going for the throat, going for the, the, what they call the stranglehold, which is synonymous with, with other large carnivals, with the big cats especially, lions, leopards, cheetahs, they, they suffocate their prey by going for the throat. Um, and we've seen that here with the dogs, which is incredible. I, I didn't actually know that they did that until today. So that was very interesting. Um, the kill was, was pretty quick. It looks like everybody's had a feed. Um, the adults go first, um, then the puppies move in, the adults move out, and it's all for the puppies at that stage. The, the adults actually get chased away from the carcass, if you can believe it, once the puppies are on top of it, um, which is a new thing that I, I didn't realize either. So they definitely give preference to the puppies, which is great to see the next generation, you know, putting their, all their effort into, into raising up the next, next generation of wild dog pups. So um, we're happy. We, we, it, it's, it's, it's an incredible experience, something I'll never forget. As the camera team revel in their success on another part of the Conservancy, tensions run high as the AWCF team respond to some troubling news. So this one is the strongest color, the one with no air. Yeah, I know it's a good one. The Save Valley anti-poaching unit has reported a wild dog carrying a wire snare around its neck. Rosemary and Jess are urgently called out to dart and remove the snare from the dog before the situation worsens. Okay, now we've, they've got the dog, so we're just keeping quiet and just waiting to see if they'll start showing first signs. The dart in and the dog down. The team move in and take action. With the snare safely removed and no injury caused, the team take this opportunity to put a tracking collar on the dog. So one of the, the main reasons for collaring these dogs, obviously so we can locate them, but also with these collars, um, they give information about where the packs are, so they take the GPS position. So if we find that the pack comes back with a whole lot of snares, you know, a couple of dogs missing, maybe a couple of injuries from snares or wires around their neck, we can use the information from these collars to go and either give these guys a heads up or go ourselves and have a look at the area because it's very obvious when a, when a pack member is caught in a snare they stay there, they, they stick around. So we can use this collar information and to help locate snare lines and, and poaching issues and also to keep a track on packs that go out of protected areas and they're therefore very vulnerable. As soon as we know they're outside from the collar then we can follow up on them and give a heads up to the communities and try and get some awareness. Going. So uh, yeah, another important thing to do when you've got a dog down is take good photos of the left and right hand sides because each dog is uniquely identifiable by their coat markings and obviously it's better if you've got them in the bush but you can't always get them so we take the opportunity just to uh, I suppose identify them through their, through their coat markings when they're down. Basically the, the pack won't go too far they'll stay nearby um, and then this dog will hopefully wake up and go and start looking for them. Um, and if they're a bit further off, they'll start calling. Um, and then they'll just reunite. The rest of the pack will come back and, and look for him. Um, you, you know, often when we've done collarings, the pack will sometimes circle nearby. So they'll never, they'll never go far off and they'll come back and collect him. Yeah. yeah, the only concern with them not meeting up with their pack is if they, um, if, you, if you end up darting very late and the rest of the pack go off hunting. And we had an incident once with a snare removal, which was a desperate situation. It was a horrible, horrible snare with the wire tight around the neck, but also through the jaw. So its head was pinned like it was, um, it couldn't do anything at all. It was horrific. And we ended up darting that dog quite late. And she was without her pack for three days. Um, but then eventually they met up. So the pack will never abandon a member. They'll keep coming back. They'll always, always try and find them. So we had a very nervous three days, but in the end, uh, the dogs were reunited. And it actually made my week. But you did. Okay, how are we doing for temperature? Can we do it again? Although wild dogs are not the intended victims, they are particularly susceptible to being accidentally caught in snares left by poachers who are trying to catch and harvest meat from other wild animals. 1.7. 2.7. The team collects important genetic samples before giving it the immobilization reversal drug.
Although slightly woozy from the anaesthetic, the dog quickly finds his feet and disappears off into the woods to rejoin the awaiting pack nearby. Next morning, Neil meets up with the Pungui pack and the pups are rather intrigued by the aerial drone. So to cover the hunt from all angles, we are not only using the motorbike and the helmet mounted cameras, but um, we've also got an aerial drone to try and capture it from a bird's eye view and capture the way that the dogs are moving through the bush and any sort of social structure and any sort of communication methods they use and how they actually go about a hunt. So uh, we've got our drone set up here in a nice open area, great for taking off. Um, only problem is that these pups, who are now four months old, are incredibly curious about more or less everything and anything that's new. And as you can see, um, they find the drone very, very, very interesting. And they just can't wait to get their teeth stuck into it. When puppies want to investigate something and they want to see what something new is and um, learn more about it. The way that they do that is they pick it up in their mouths and they chew on it and they bite it and they carry it around as you can see they do with sticks and old dry uh, buffalo poos and that sort of thing. They, they're constantly picking things up in their mouths, chewing them, tasting them. And I fear if they got hold of the drone that would probably come back to us in a number of different pieces. Something unfortunately our budget doesn't cater for. It seems like the pups have lost interest a bit. They all seem to be playing with different sticks and branches and all sorts of other things. So I'm going to try leaving the drone for a second and hope that they don't, don't go for it. Let's test. Find your own toys, I'm afraid. No, 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 So it's encouraging to see that um, the puppies uh, show absolutely no fear of us or the motorbikes. Um, they're, they're definitely curious of us but, and, and apprehensive, but they're definitely not scared of us. You know, they won't come right up and, and lick me on the leg or bite me on the leg, but they um, are, are very happy to come near us. Um, and the same goes when we join them on the hunt. Um, you'll see from the footage they, 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 they accept they accept me into the pack as, as part of the hunting team and the puppies will very often run along behind me like I was one of the more superior adults in, in, the, in the pack. So it's great that, they, that these puppies are, are so used to us now that they, we, we, don't, we don't interfere or have any impact on their natural lives. They just get on with it. So for me, that just confirms that um, using motorbikes is definitely the, the best way to follow these dogs on on the hunt there. They're used to the researchers monitoring them on motorbikes and they're, they're used to us going along and filming them on the motorbikes. So um, it bodes well for the series and hopefully we'll be able to actually capture some of the, the more important and hidden, hidden wonders and dynamics of, of the hunt. Right puppies, I think mums and dads are calling. Time to go hunting now, off you go. As evening approaches and the sun starts to set, the dogs become more active and the team captures the beauty of the moment in the golden hour.
Neil and Kane join the pack as they begin their evening hunt. The dogs are in no rush to make a kill and instead find a nearby water hole to cool off in. No hunt for the team, but some beautiful moments captured. Rosemary, on the other hand, has luckily managed to find the splinters pack, also relaxing at a dam. Okay, so we've just come, this is Botwa Dam, um, and we've just come to look at Splinter's Pack, um, who are here. They're quite often here, they, they like this area, and when they're in this area, they often come down to the water, especially this time of year when it's so hot. Um, so it's quite late in the evening at the moment, which is great timing, so I'm just going to go pull over, um, watch them for a while, and see if they get up to anything interesting. Oh, here we go. We've got some activity from these three over here, including old Hopalong. You can see the one there with just the three legs. Um, so here's Hopalong off to the water. We call him Hopalong for obvious reasons, but um, it's actually a really sad story. He, a um, couple of years ago, probably even three years ago, it was 2012 sometime, the pack was, must have run through a snare line and we lost one individual who was found dead later in the snare. Um, we had another one with a horrific injury around his neck um, and, a, and a very tight wire snare, which we managed to dart and remove, and he made a full recovery, which was amazing, because it, it was a very, very deep wound. Um, and then at the same time, uh, this dog came back, and, and we surmised that he actually uh, um, ended up chewing his leg off to get out of the snare. He would have been caught around the ankle. Um, and, and the, the injury at the time suggested that's what he'd done. But he's made a full recovery as well, and for the last three years been a fully functioning member of the pack. It's quite amazing. So the fact that he's, he's still going strong is very much a testament to the, this very close social structure that the wild dogs have because they simply won't leave a pack member behind. And if at the beginning when he was struggling, you know, they'll wait for him, they'll, they'll regurgitate for him. If he doesn't make the kill in time, they'll often wait for him to eat at the kills. Um, so it's a fantastic, it's just, it's just a, a visual demonstration of the very close um, family nature and very um, sort of social pack bonded structure. Oh, okay, there's a water buck over there. Check, I wonder if they're gonna see it. Yep. Let's see what happens. Mm, yeah, they're all looking very alert. That is really, that is beautiful. Look at that, Eland and an Impala. Sure, that's spectacular, what lovely light. Dog's still not showing a great deal of interest. They're very lazy today. Elon's a bit nervous. He sensed them. But he's also not really prey, so should be right. Impala, on the other hand, could be doing with being a bit more cautious, but perhaps he senses the dogs aren't really ready for hunting. Impala's walking straight in front of those dogs who are barely lifting their heads. A couple of them watching him, but no action whatsoever. Hmm. It's fantastic. You can really see the size difference there with this eland, not even a particularly big eland. And then the dogs, which suddenly look remarkably small. Oh, now there's some action but they're not interested in Elon, they're going fast. Actually, what have they got? Oh, the warthog. Oh, fantastic. Oh my gosh, look. The rest of the pack of, hey, look, they've cornered them for the warthog against the rocks. This is interesting. 
Warthogs are a bit of a, f um, a formidable prey though for wild dogs. They're not usually very successful when they, they try this, but let's see if it's a good point. Warthog's tusks are incredible defense. They're really powerful. So if he's protecting his backside, which he can do very effectively against the rocks, the pack probably won't stand a chance. Oh, and they charges. They can be quite aggressive, warthogs. They can do serious damage with those tusks if they get close enough. So the dogs are being um, very wary, quite rightly. Yeah, the dogs are moving off. I think they know when they're beaten. And when they've left him, the warthog in peace for a bit, but interesting to see how he's going to escape, because as soon as he turns to run away, he'll then be vulnerable from behind. And off they go, full speed ahead, sure. Look at that. What have they found? Lots of playfulness going on there. These must be the youngsters. Yeah, they are the youngsters. Sure, they've suddenly got a lot of energy. Oh, lots of fun. Yeah, it looks like they've gone. They just disappeared off probably to hunt. Hopefully something more suitable than that dog. So anyway, what an amazing afternoon, and now um, sun setting, the dogs have gone, um, and uh, I'm going to head home, but um, hopefully we'll catch up with the pack in the next day or two. Rosemary alerts the camera team that Splinter's pack are on the move and heading east. Following day, Kane locates the pack as they prepare for another hunt. Neil races across to catch up with the pack before they make a kill. Okay. So we received a report this afternoon of some wild dogs in this area, a large pack of wild dogs uh, who we suspect to be splinters. Uh, we've come along this afternoon firstly to find out who, who the pack is, um, and secondly, to see if we can actually join them on another hunt. Um, it's coming just after 5 p.m., so hopefully they'll be becoming active or certainly about to start moving off for, for a hunt. Um, and this area has got a lot of game in it. We've got wildebeest, impala, zebra, uh, all sorts, everything. And with a large pack of dogs like that, uh, it's highly likely that they'll be looking for, for larger prey now. They normally just hunt impala, but now that they've got so many mouths to feed, uh, near, over, 30, over 30 dogs in that pack, uh, we suspect that they're going to be looking for bigger prey now possibly wildebeest, maybe on the off chance zebra. So um, we're gonna give it a shot and see if we can find them and get a nice hunt. just in time with dogs already on the prowl and eager for a meal.
Wow, okay. Pretty incredible chase this afternoon. We, we managed to catch up with splinters. They're already on the move, already hunting pretty early for, for, for their usual standard. Um, and just out of nowhere, we, we came into a herd of probably 30 or 40 wildebeest, and they just hit it hard. They were just running in and out of the acacia. There was dust everywhere. I didn't know where I was going. Um, and uh, eventually, it, it, it looked as though at one point the, the pack had surrounded, surrounded the wildebeest, and they sort of got to, together in a tight ball, making themselves much more um, impenetrable and, and protecting all the little ones on the inside. However, it, it seemed that during the confusion, the, the dogs managed to separate um, a bull, a, a female, and a young, young wildebeest. And uh, they drove them round and round, and eventually the wildebeest ran into the water, which we, we often see with prey sometimes. They will run into water. I'm not quite sure why, perhaps to you know, put off the predators, or they sort of see it as, a, as, a, as a, their only means of escape, as a sort of last resort. But unfortunately, going into the water just gives the dogs a chance to uh, get their bearings, surround the water hole, and, and they just go straight in at them. Um, so eventually, when the wildebeest ran out, the adult bull went one way, and the female and her baby went another, and they headed into this thicket here, and unfortunately, uh, the female got away, but uh, the, the, the youngster wasn't, wasn't as lucky, um, unfortunately for him, but um, it's great to see that, that the dogs are now actively hunting bigger prey, but it's uh, still great to see that they, they, they've changed their dynamic, they're adapting to, to the environment, they're adapting to the situation that they've presented themselves in, and they're doing very well at it. Um, uh, Incredible to see. I'm very lucky to have actually witnessed this firsthand. I mean, the whole thing, you know, from the time that they actually grabbed it, I mean, it's only been maybe 10 minutes and it's, it's finished, you know, it's over. They, they are very quick and very efficient killers when it comes down to it. Success for Splinter's pack and the camera team. Coming up in the next episode, Pungwe are in striking distance. Will they succeed? Remember to hold it, listen all the way The community the gets involved in conservation. Because maybe the dogs are this side now. Okay, Jess is in the right place at the right time to witness something astonishing. Rosemary gets hands on with Africa's largest predator. The camera crew gets stuck into a muddy rescue. Pungwe pursued yet another successful takedown. The African wild dog is considered to be Africa's most efficient and successful hunter. With a population of only around 6,500 individuals, or 660 packs, it is also Southern Africa's most rare large carnivore. However, Organizations like the African Wildlife Conservation Fund, AWCF, were on a mission to guarantee the survival of this inspiring species. Through their efforts, these dogs, once verging on the brink of local extinction, are making a comeback. Previously on Wild Dogs Chasing Tales, the camera team captured their first hunt. Rosemary met the Conservancy's newest arrivals. We documented Pungui's first full hunt. The AWCF team removed a snare. Rosemary witnessed a close encounter between the dogs and the warthog. And we watched Splinters make a successful kill. 
coming up in this episode. Pungui are in striking distance. Remember to hold it, listen. AWCF to teaches local children about conservation. <laughs> Jess is in the right place at the right time. Rosemary gets hands-on with Africa's largest predator. The camera crew gets stuck into a muddy rescue. And Pungui are successful in their latest takedown. As dawn breaks over the Save Valley Conservancy, all manner of species begin to stir, including a pack of wild dogs. Cameraman Neil Fairley races out to attempt to catch the pack in action. Okay, uh, we're rushing down to the south of the Conservancy now to see if we can catch Pungui. Apparently they're already on the hunt. They're close to a herd of Impala, so we're going to rush down there and uh, see if we can get any action, um, get some hunting on, on, on camera. Neil meets up with the dogs that are already on the move and in hunting formation. The dogs are intent, and an early morning chase seems imminent. A target is identified, and the chase is on. Okay, well, no luck today with the dogs. Um, they made a bit of a chase. Uh, we had at least two dogs that were chasing Impala, but um, it, it, it didn't kind of work out the way that they wanted it to. Uh, you know, we see a lot of wild dog chases on, uh, publicized on, on other shows on TV, talking about how they hunt and the fact that they will wear down prey over long distances with, you know, relay of dogs taking over from one another. Well, that's not what we noticed today at all. Um, it's, it seemed like, you know, we had two dogs that were intent on, on hunting in parlor, but neither one really knew what the other was doing at the time. And, and at one point, I mean, we were well within striking distance of the Impala. I mean, I could have jumped off my bike and jumped on one of their backs. Um, and the Impala just went straight between the dogs. So obviously the dogs were not communicating about, you know, different roles on that hunt. Um, and the Impala got away. So one to the Impala, nil to Pungui. But we'll have to see how it develops uh, as we follow more and more hunts and see if there, there are any methods of communication and perhaps when you've got a bigger pack that they have different roles. But uh, certainly today, uh, the Impala got away with its life and lucky him. As part of the AWCF Community Engagement Initiative, a group of local school children are visiting the Conservancy to learn more about wild dogs and conservation. Rosemary and Jess takes a group out for some fun in the bush. Every year, um, the AWCF runs a field course for our scholarship. 
uh, students. We run a scholarship program at the moment. We've got 18 scholarship students um, and we call them predator scholars. So we maintain the link um, between the wildlife and the and the um, benefit that they're receiving in terms of education. So we've got 18, our 18 scholars here and we've got also a number of our scouts and our um, AWCF staff's children as well here, just so they can benefit and learn um, from this opportunity. So at the moment, we're at the beginning of the course and we're just going on a bush walk, which is a fantastic way to get the kids out, get them understanding about the plants and the trees and the tracks and the termite mounds and the bird calls and bush survival so that they you know, they start to appreciate the ecosystems and the um, natural world for what it is. So what we're doing here basically is we've actually hidden a couple of wild dog collars um, and we're pretending it's a, a pack of dogs just because it, it's more than just a tracking exercise. Obviously we want to get them understanding how to use the telemetry equipment, the receivers, the antennas, and, but we also need them to understand how to behave in the bush when you are tracking a real live animal. If we just tell them it's a collar, you know, then there's no sense of excitement and there's no real... Yeah, the behaviour's wrong, so we're trying to encourage the right behaviour in the bush as well as the understanding of the telemetry. But basically what we've done is just hidden a couple of collars and when they find them, we're going to have someone jump out of them to scare them because they're going to be way too noisy and then we're going to just going to make it a lesson of how to behave and how not to behave in the bush. So go find us some wild dogs. Walk that way, just listening to the signal. So even though we know, and Josh is absolutely right, he's picked it up very well, that the signal is not along the road now, it's over here. We're not going to go off in the bush now. We're going to keep walking and he's going to listen very carefully until the signal is strongest here. Okay, and then we're going to go in very quietly and carefully. Okay? group anxiously move in on the signal, unaware of what lies ahead. We deliberately hit these guys so that you can learn to pay attention to the sounds of the bush. Okay, so you were walking, you are all a little bit noisy, and then you heard grrr. Okay, and then everybody behaved quite right. Everybody stopped, nobody ran away, that was perfect. But you stopped and you listened and you looked. Okay, that's what you need to do. You need to listen to the sounds of the bush. With an important lesson taught, the group can relax and enjoy some fun and games in the bush and take in all the spectacular sights and sounds the Conservancy has to offer. As the day winds down, Jess moves south to follow up on a recent sighting of the Pungui pack. Right, so this morning the scouts found Pungui Pack um, in a really beautiful spot in the Conservancy. So it's boiling hot and it's been a really long work day. So I've decided to treat myself and go and sit with my, with my dogs and just enjoy the afternoon. Right, so we've arrived at the spot where the dogs are um, and we can still see that there's 13 puppies all looking very fat and healthy and lazy and there's still the 11 adults, um, so that's great. And they're just very relaxed at the moment, but it's still pretty hot, so we're just going to sit here with them and, and then see what they get up to a bit later this evening. Hearing something. Oh, no. Clearly not anything too important. So what's so fantastic about the pups at this age, they're so playful and they'll roll and tumble with each other and just have so much fun. It's so fantastic to watch. Oh. Time to wake up the, the adults. Saying, come on, you're hungry. <laughs> Discipline for the afternoon.
Okay, well, we can see them um, moving off now, so they're most likely going off to hunt. So we've had a fantastic afternoon with them, but we, they're going to move off into this thick stuff now and probably go and hunt something. So we are going to call it an evening and yeah, head back to camp. Hang on, like they're, they're chasing something. Okay, all right, well, let's go, let's go, let's go. Are you holding on? <laughs> You hope Yuri doesn't fail you. <laughs> okay, just hang on, Daniel. Can you still see them? I, I mean, I can't believe that. We literally left them about less than a minute ago. They've obviously just opportunistically come across a, a young elander. They've obviously isolated it. Um, I think we saw some of the, the rest of the herd run off, but we, but we can't be sure. We just saw a bit of dust, and now you know, literally the whole pack is on this, is on this young eland. Um, it's, it's amazing. They've, they've killed it really quickly, and they're all having a good feed. So, Flip, what, a, what an amazing evening. I, I really cannot believe how quickly these dogs have made a kill. Although, I mean, I shouldn't be surprised, considering they are Africa's most efficient and successful hunters. But it's just, I mean, when you see it like that in real time, it's unbelievable. One of the, the classic um, traits with the, with the pack dynamics of wild dogs is that they let their puppies feed first, well, you know, then they're not, obviously they're not always the first ones on the kill, so the adults that have made the kill will have a good scoff and then the, they always let the puppies um, feed first, which is very different to to lions and, and other carnivores, which will, you know, with with, with lions, the, the males will eat first um, before the puppies or before the cubs even get a chance. So I think that's something that's really special about wild dogs. This is a good sizable kill for this pack because they've obviously got a lot of mouths to feed. Um, and a lot of them, as I said, have already had a good feed. So the and there's a lot of meat left still on this on this kill, so they'll probably hang around for a bit if, if nothing else disturbs them and they don't feel threatened to move on um, and really have a good feed this evening. Looks like Jigsaw's trying to come back for second. Oh, that's a bit of a cheeky bugger. <laughs> There's this one pup that's that's just nipping at, at Jigsaw. what she's trying to get near the kill. You know, this, the thing is, these pups are getting you know a little bit bigger now, and they're getting a bit braver, so they're starting to test their boundaries. Um, and this one obviously thinks it can challenge mom to some extra food. <laughs> these dogs will not, they will not leave anything. As I said, unless they're disturbed, they will strip this carcass completely. Um, so it's really, you know, it's they kill, but they don't waste anything. All that'll be left is, is literally the skeleton. Yeah, all slopping down now with big full bellies. What an unbelievable evening, and really just so special to have been able to witness this and to spend some time like this with these dogs. And um, yeah, sometimes makes all the, the hard graft and the slog worth it. As the sun sets over the Save Valley Conservancy, Rosemary prepares for an evening operation involving Africa's largest predator. Using the last rays of light, she finalizes preparations for what should be an interesting encounter. All right, so we are um, going to try and dart a lion this evening to take a collar off 
Um, it's an expired collar. It's been on about three years. Um, the VHF signal that we use to locate the animal is not working very well. It's very intermittent, very weak most of the time. And the GPS um, sort of functioning uh, part of it stopped working um, several months ago. And there's a lot of collar stored on that, uh, a lot of information stored on that collar, which we need to get off. So we're just preparing. We've got a bait set up. We should make up some darts. And then with luck, we're going to be able to call the um, lioness in and, and take off that uh, expired collar. Using slightly bigger needles for lions than we do for dogs, just because their skin is slightly thicker, it has to go in that much further to get to the deep muscle mass. All right, so we've made the dots up. We made a couple up, just one for spare in case. Um, we're just going to check just now with the telemetry that the lions are still nearby. They were earlier this afternoon. Um, and assuming they're all still right here, we're going to start calling just before dark. Um, and hopefully they're going to come onto the bait and we'll put a dart in. Um, we'll call them using some fairly interesting sounds, which you'll hear shortly. OK, good. So they're still there. Right, so you can see the bait setup we've got here. Um, obviously, the bait plus the call up um, is going to attract the lion. The scent from the bait is a powerful attractant. And then we've got what we call a, a blind of thorn bushes behind the bait on either side, which means that when the lions come in to feed, they will come in front of that and they'll stand sideways on, which gives us you know, the right sort of darting shot. If we don't have that blind of thorns, then they might well come from behind and just try and pull the bait a little bit around the tree, in which case we've only got a face shot and there's nothing we can do. So it's laid out specifically to give us the right darting opportunity. The other reason it's so good to have a bait, um, especially darting at night, is because it actually it, it serves to usually keep the lions close by once the dart is hit. If you don't have a bait and you're sort of free darting, there's nothing to stop that lion that's just been darted running off and disappearing into the bush. And of course, wandering around at night in the dark looking for a half sleepy lion with a bunch of other lions around is um, not, the, not the most sensible thing to do. So with a bait here, what often happens is the dart will hit the lion, lion and then they'll run away a little bit and then they'll actually come back to the bait and keep eating. And that makes just the whole situation a lot more controllable. Okay, the sound you can hear in the background is the um, a buffalo calf in distress. Uh, it's a classic noise used to call up lions and, and other carnivores. Um, if this doesn't bring in the pride, then there are other noises we can use. One is a, we call it a pig squeal. It's a horrific noise. Let's hope we don't have to use it. Um, and then sometimes, depending on the group of lions you're trying to call in, you can bring, you can play a noise of hyenas. And certainly if it's a big pride and it's got some adult males, um, playing a hy noise of hyenas um, really gets them coming and they come running and spoiling for a fight. Like, who wears these hyenas, you know? Under the cover of darkness, it's not long before the pride appears and begins to feed on the bait. But no sign of the collared female. Okay, well, we've had an amazing evening. We've had a couple of hours of, you know, great lion sighting, but unfortunately the collared lioness didn't come in. So we're going to wrap it up for this evening. Um, we've done our best to call her. We've tried all sorts, but um, she's not interested tonight. So we'll call her a wrap and we'll maybe try again tomorrow night. As day breaks, Rosemary and Jess are off on an investigation regarding the splinters pack after a very unusual report from one of the scouts. Yeah, so we've just come, we, our scouts have reported um, the alpha female from the splinters pack here, V, is, is pregnant again. But, I mean, it, it would be very, very unusual if she was. Um, you know, it's, it's a crazy time of year, so 
we've just come to to follow up and I think I think she's there. But did you think she's there? No, I haven't been able to see her yet, but she's the the rest of the pack is all around here, so she might pop out just now. It's most bizarre. I mean if it's true it's gonna be very unusual. <laughs> what about there? Yeah there is some movement there. That's her on the back left. Oh my god. No it is yeah, yeah. and she totally is pregnant. <laughs> oh my god <laughs> No, is it? Is it you sure it's in? Yeah. Look, you can yeah, see yeah. it. You can see it. And she's totally pregnant. So this is, what is this? This is late November. It's nearly December, for heaven's sake. And she had, so this alpha female was the same one that had the litter in, as normal, in May, June mm. this year. She had seven pups, five are still alive. Yeah. So what she's doing being pregnant again? <laughs> Have you ever, I mean, history uh, of the project? No, been... no, definitely not. Actually, when the scouts first reported it, I asked um, colleagues of mine, and they've never heard of it happening either. Mm -hmm. So, looks like a it's first. A history in the making. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> first for the wild dog world. Yay, puppies in January. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this this is obviously really interesting and really exciting for us. So what we'll do is get the, the scouts just to keep tabs on them really closely. And if and when uh, V does start denning, um, yeah, we'll do the same. We'll put camera traps up and we'll just monitor really closely and just try and figure out what's going on. I mean, now we have no idea why why they would be doing this. So. No, I think we can come up with uh, with various uh, speculative hypotheses, but, but the long and the short of it is we don't know. It's very mm. unusual. Um, it has been a very dry year. That may be something to do with it, but... You know, and none of the other packs are doing it, so really it's it's an anomaly. Um, mm. But it'll be yeah, just really, really important to keep a close eye on exactly what's going on, how many pups, which is alpha male, and how the pack behaves with this sort of slightly um, out-of-the-ordinary denning event in, in the middle of January. Normally, denning season is from May to September, with pregnancies occurring between February and March. So it is extremely unusual for V to be pregnant in November. The team will have to monitor splinters carefully to assess how the pack will cope with this unusual situation. Further west, we catch up with Neil and Kane, who have found themselves getting stuck into a very muddy scenario. Right, so it's nearly dark. It's five past six, and we've followed the wild dogs to this pan um, on the hunt, and they, we saw that they were paying a special attention to this area here. And you've just noticed, if you look over here, baby zebra stuck in the mud. And the wild dogs were interested. They were going closer and closer and closer, but for, for some reason they decided that they didn't want to go for it. Um, maybe they were scared they were going to get stuck in the mud, we're not sure. Anyway, we're going to try and pull out the baby, so we better act fast. It's, it's nearly dark, so let's go. Seems like it's another young juvenile here. Hey? Yes. Shame. Wonder how long it's been sitting for. So what can we do, Ken? Dwanza? There's a Dwanza by the front goombos. Let me try and take the goombo and... As this waterhole is man-made and the lethal mud a factor of human activity, the camera team makes a rare decision to intervene. I've got to be careful. It doesn't bite. <laughs> Nearly out. It's dangerous. There we go, that's that okay. It's easy to see how you can get stuck in this. seem to appreciate the fact. Do it! Open! It's coming. It's close. I think you can feel it's close to getting out. Just doesn't quite have the strength or the grip in its back legs to power himself out. And we don't have the power in our arms or legs to get him out. But uh, he's close, he's nearly out. 
I don't think it realizes that we're trying to help it. it keeps trying to bite Kane, and uh, it's making life a little bit difficult. It's so close. Very close now. As darkness approaches, time is of the essence to free the young zebra. Yes. Watch out. It's okay. It's got the energy still. Probably just needs a chance to catch its breath. Don't know if it'll be able to get up yet. There we go. Wonderful. And now we just hope for the best for him. Still got a chance it with the lions, leopards, wild dogs. So at least he's not going to die a slow, painful death in, a, in the water hole. Finally, the rains have arrived. Enjoying the rejuvenated bush felt, Jess links up with the elusive Mapura pack. Right, so we've managed to meet up with Mapura pack again this afternoon. Um, we bumped into them very early this morning. They were hunting on the Shoshakwe airstrip. Um, and Kane followed them and found them resting at a nice little water pan not far from here. Um, and this is just a, a real treat because I'm not sure if you remember, but the last time we were looking for the pack, they were, we were climbing up that little gomo or hill to try and, and see them. They were still denning at that stage. Um, and because we had to walk in, they were a bit skittish and they were running away. Um, it's also really nice that they've come back into the conservancy because they were denning outside. But unfortunately, they do seem to have run into a little bit of trouble. Um, two of them are, are carrying snares. One is very loose. So um, that's not too bad, obviously, but we will want to get that off as soon as possible and just monitor and make sure it doesn't get any tighter. And then unfortunately, one of the younger males, he's picked up quite a bad snare on his back right foot and it seems to have cut in quite badly and his foot's quite swollen. So what uh, our main priority here is this afternoon is to, to try and get some really nice pictures to see how he's moving on it. He doesn't look to have lost too much condition, which is good. And obviously we will try and stay on this packet as, as much as possible over the next couple of days um, and then try and make a plan to get the snare off. So, I mean, you may remember we were discussing when we were going in to see the den how, you know, Mapura might have been quite smart in choosing to den outside because there's less competition with lions. They weren't too close to the, the settlement, so they weren't being, you know, shippered too much or worried too much from, from people. But obviously when they're moving like that on the edges of protected areas, there will be snare lines that they, they could have run into. And one of the things that's quite sad and really quite troubling to have seen is that the alpha female Ursula is missing. Um, and we can only assume that since the other dogs are carrying snares, it's likely that she's run into some trouble. Um, and in fact, Ruben, our head scout, was reporting that she was missing a couple of weeks ago, but photos now have confirmed that it definitely is her. So we will obviously keep a lookout for her. And if she has strayed off for a little bit and joins the pack, we'll be able to see that but the chances are that if she's been away from the dogs for that long, um, she's, she probably has died somewhere of, of a cause that you know, we, we won't be able to determine unless we're able to find the carcass.
Okay, so as you can see, the, the puppies have been nicely active for the last 20 minutes or so. So, probably going to start rolling the adults up um, and the pack's going to head off to hunt. So, I'm going to head back to base and Kane and the camera team are going to follow the dogs for a bit and see if they can watch them making their kill and getting their supper tonight. <laughs> As usual, Mapura move into a deep, inaccessible thicket to hunt, where not even the bikes can follow. So Neil and Kane race off to try and link up the Pungui before their evening hunt. Luckily, they meet up with the pack just as they are beginning their hunting routine. of up to 55 kilometers per hour are recorded as the chase gains momentum. The camera team is yet to spot the target. Success. Neil reaches the dogs just as they take down an adult male impala. A substantial meal for the pack and well worth the chase. Okay, another very exciting evening with the dogs tonight. Uh, we're with Pungui Pak, who, as you can see here, have just made a, a kill. They've killed a, an adult impala, which is more or less finished now. Um, an incredible long chase, uh, one of the longest I've ever been on while I've been following the packs out here. And yeah, just over two kilometers that was um, at full speed. Um, We'll have to review the footage to see who actually the, the, was, was heading up the chase and who actually made the, made the takedown in the end. But I, I suspect it was either Ten or, Ten or Benguela, because both of them are very exhausted now. And I, I feel like when we arrived with all the excitement, they were, they were already there when we got there with the pups. Very exciting chase and luckily just enough light to, to make the most of it and get some good shots. As you can see in the background now, we've got um, some, some other visitors coming in who get chased every so often by the dogs, but these black backed jackals are, are very brave. Um, they're coming right in here and they're just helping themselves to scraps on, around the kill, where basically where the kill was made, which is just where they are now. Um, they're just enjoying some, some of the leftover snacks and I'm sure once the dogs move off or, or go off to, to lie down for the evening, the, the jackals will be in here uh, to make the most of whatever's left. They're very brave to come that close to the dogs. They get chased. Here we go. Here we go. They're very quick, as you can see. I mean, the dogs are blindingly fast, but the jackals over short distances have got them six love every time. Anyway, a splendid evening. Great for the dogs. They, they didn't make a kill this morning because we were with them this morning, so I know they were hungry um, and they were desperate, so they've, they've made a kill. The pack is happy and um, we'll try to catch up with them tomorrow and see what's, what's on the menu then. Rosemary prepares for round two on the lion darting saga. Being the large carnivore expert in the conservancy, she's familiar with these types of tasks. All right, well, it's day two today. Um, we had that beautiful, really beautiful sighting of the uh, lioness and cubs last night, but unfortunately the collared lioness that we're looking for didn't come in. Um, we've picked up her signal today. She's moved, so we've moved. Um, and she's just behind us in the riverbed, and hopefully she'll come in this evening. Just
With the bait set and under cover of darkness, the team wait patiently for the lioness to appear. So we've just started her, she's run off, we've got a visual of where we think she is um, and she, she's had about eight minutes now so we're just going to go and approach, see if we can get a visual, leave her for another couple of minutes until we properly approach. Um, but she's just behind the bush at the moment so we want to make sure everything's fine. I need the blindfold. The lioness is blindfolded to protect her eyes and prevent any external stimulus. The next morning, Jess is called out to investigate a newly discovered denning site. Okay, so this morning we've come out um, just to follow up on a spotted hyena den, which our scout Akim bumped into the other day. He was actually tracking Mapura pack, um, or what he believes to be Mapura pack, 
and uh, he was following their tracks and the tracks, tracks actually led him to this, this spotty den. Um, and so it's, it's very close and it's quite accessible. So we thought we'd just come and have a look at, the, at, the, at these carnivals, which are a little bit more elusive here than Sabi Valley. We don't see them as often as we do some of the others. Um, so yeah, so Akim, the scout, is, is up ahead just tracking and we're just gonna go in and then see if we can find. So we've, um, we've just rounded the, the, you know, the corner here and we could see the, the den just off in the distance and there was actually a sub-adult hyena there. But unfortunately, as soon as he saw us um, or caught wind of us, he's, he's just moved off um, further north there. So we're just going to go in a little bit slowly and quietly um, and just see if there's anyone else around or what's going on. So when you, so when Pura came, yeah. did you see the tracks coming straight yeah, to the yeah, den? Yeah, I see the, the tracks. And they just came here? Yeah. yeah. Well, do you want to have a look around and see if we can find like a resting or play area? Okay. okay. Um, so we've, just what we've been looking around trying to find a spot for the cameras, we've come across this um, impala skull, um, which is just another sort of reconfirming factor that this den is relatively, well, is active. Um, and you can see it's quite amazing that it actually, you know, it shows the strength of their jaws. They've been able to, to basically chew off the whole front snout um, of the animal. So definitely my stomach's telling me it's, it's quite fresh. <laughs> so, yeah. So we've just finished putting up the cameras um, and we're just going to move away so that we're not um, disturbing the den area too much. Um, but yeah, we'll leave them up for four or five days and then come back and check. And hopefully we'll have some really nice pictures of maybe some newborn spotties in Savi Valley. On the western side of the Conservancy, Neil is standing by with Pungui Pack, hoping to join them on another evening hunt. Right, we're with the Pungui pack today and it's um, half past five. Uh, the pack seems to be pretty relaxed at the moment, but I can see the pups are starting to become a little bit more active, a little bit more restless, which um, normally implies that they're going to get up and go on a hunt soon. So as soon as they get up, we'll join them on the hunt on the motorbikes. What we've experienced so far by following them is they, they just accept us as being one of the pack and, and we literally just ride with them on the hunt. There's no possible way we could ever do it on foot. Um, for one, it would upset the dogs and other animals and um, we'd never be able to keep up with them. Right, looks like a couple of them have got up and they're moving off towards the thicket there, so it's, it's possible they're going to start hunting. Um, so we're going to get ready. Um, Get our cameras rolling and join them on the hunt and see see what we can find. the Mapani forest in search of prey. Fortunately for the camera crew, the pack emerge out into some open acacia scrubland. Perfect terrain for filming and keeping up with the pack. It's not long before they pick up the fresh scent of potential prey and the hunt kicks up a gear. Suddenly, the dogs veer off back into the Mapani forest, and it seems the camera crew have their work cut out for them.
Neil reaches the lead dogs just in time to see them take down a young Impala. A quick kill means success for the pack and success for the camera team. It only takes the pack a few short minutes to completely strip the carcass. Each dog tugs at the flesh in different directions, which helps the pack as a whole to remove the flesh from the bone quickly. They swallow large chunks of meat, which helps when regurgitating later on, if required. No wonder they are considered to be Africa's most efficient and successful hunters. A great way to end the day. Coming up in the next episode, Rosemary catches up with the Conservancy's rarest large carnivore. Pungui corner of Wildebeest, will they triumph? Breeding season has started. The pack are on the hunt for Impala. Rosemary deals with a shocking snare removal. The pups are intrigued by an unusual toy. They're getting really brave now. And the Splinter Pack take on another herd of wildebeest. The African wild dog is considered to be Africa's most efficient and successful hunter. With a population of only around 6,500 individuals, or 660 packs, it is also Southern Africa's most rare large carnivore. However, organizations like the African Wildlife Conservation Fund, AWCF, were on a mission to guarantee the survival of this inspiring species. Through their efforts, these dogs, once verging on the brink of local extinction, are making a comeback. It's an incredible experience, something I'll never forget. Wow, this is so special. So we've arrived at the day. Previously on Wild Dogs Chasing Tails. Pungui missed a golden opportunity. Jess was in the right place at the right time. Rosemary darted Africa's largest carnivore. The camera team carried out a dirty rescue. And Pungui came right and made a decent kill. Coming up in this episode, Rosemary catches up with the Conservancy's rarest large carnivore. Pungui get waist deep into their hunting. Denning season has started. The pack are on the hunt for Impala. Rosemary deals with a shocking snare removal. 
The pups are intrigued by an unusual toy. We're getting really brave now. And splinters take on another herd of wildebeest. It's early morning after the first rains, and all species, big and small, are feeling active and rejuvenated. Including a trio of cheetah who have been spotted by Kane on his morning patrol. Rosemary takes some time out to sit with them for a while. So we are amazingly lucky this morning. Kane found these three cheetah, and we've come come to see them. And it's they are such magnificent animals. It's such a privilege to be able to see them. Um, they're so rare here as well. We've got maybe a dozen or so in an area of about two and a half thousand square kilometres. This group we do know. It's a coalition of three males, um, and they're seen in this area from time to time. But it's just. It's really, really special to get to see them. They're just magnificent. Another reason they're particularly special to me is that I actually work as the Southern African coordinator for the range-wide conservation program for cheetah and African wild dogs. Um, this is a joint initiative of the Zoological Society of London and Wildlife Conservation Society. And part of my role is to sort of try and coordinate and assist and support the conservation of both cheetah and wild dogs across southern Africa. Um, so to have them on my doorstep like this is really, really fantastic. Um, so cheetah are, are very low density um, species at the best of times. They range widely. Um, and there's the latest IUCN figures put them at only 6,600 individuals left in the wild currently classified as vulnerable, but there are discussions underway about uplisting them to endangered. So, so with a global population of, of you know, less than 7,000 individuals in Africa, of course, there's 80 to 100 or so um, in Iran, but really very, very vulnerable, very fragile species. Cheetah are actually targeted specifically for the illegal pet trade. They are you know, it mainly impacts populations in the Horn of Africa. I think we're only just starting to realise the impact that the um, illegal pet trade actually has on wild cheetah populations. And there have been studies done, largely headed up by the Cheetah Conservation Fund, um, which show that uh, five out of six cubs will die in transit, die or disappear in transit. So anyway, bearing all that in mind, it's fantastic to see these guys here. They're, they're fit, fat and healthy. Um, no snares, no injuries. They, they've been around quite a long time. Um, so hopefully they've also been breeding with some of the females we know are around. And hopefully, slowly but surely, the Savi Valley population will pick up. It used to be a lot higher than it is. So we're hoping it will get back to previous levels. And these guys hopefully will play a role in that. It's been absolutely phenomenal to spend this time with them, really, really special. But yeah, I think we'll leave them to it and hopefully catch up with them another day. A rare and lucky sighting for Rosemary. Nearby, Jess is on her way to discover something even more extraordinary. Right, so you may remember um, a few weeks ago that we mentioned that we'd seen the alpha female of Splinter's Pack pregnant again. And when we last saw the dogs, she wasn't with them, so we assumed that she'd started denning. Um, and five or six days ago, the scouts did actually find a den uh, for the pack. So, you know, it's a very interesting turn of events at the end of the year because 
this is, you know, it's completely out of their normal denning season. They normally den from May to sort of August, September um, of every year. So, yeah, we're just going to come have a look and see what's going on and just watch very intently and see how the story unfolds. It's very unusual for a pack of dogs to den twice in one year. Particularly when they still have a healthy litter of pups from the previous denning season, who are still just a few months old. Denning in the rainy season will no doubt be a huge challenge for the pack. Okay, so as we drove in, we could see fresh tracks um, around, so we assume that the dogs are still here and the den is active. But Kane's just collecting the, the camera trap, and then we'll have a look on the SD card and see for sure if there has actually been activity. Um, the camera traps are just a really nice way to non-invasively monitor what's happening at the den when we can't be here. So we've just got the, the footage back from the den camera and we can see that the den is definitely still active because the rest of the pack has, has been around, um, around the den. We've seen the alpha female going in and out um, and we can actually see the puppies just um, right by the opening of the den hole. So they're still quite little, um, so they, they won't be fully out, but I think it's because it's really hot now at the time, this time of the year, they're probably coming a bit more closer to the entrance, they can get some fresh air. Um, and Kane said that when he went to go and change the camera trap that um, the, you can smell that the den is still being used. So the dogs have a very distinct odour um, and this den definitely has, smells like an active den. While Jess relishes the arrival of these unexpected pups, cameraman Neil Fairley links up with the Pungui pack for the afternoon. Right, well, Kane's managed to track down Pungui today, and um, they're back in their favorite territory. This is a, a nice sort of semi-open acacia scrubland, and the Pungui pack particularly rarely like to hunt here. This is one of their favorite spots, and it's great for us because it's a lot easier to ride the bikes here than to try and follow them through the thick woodlands and, and, uh, and forests that they, uh, they also tend to hunt in sometimes. So we're very happy that they're here. At the moment, there's not a lot of life in them. Um, they all seem to be fast asleep, but it is, it is cooling down and it's getting late and it's almost hunting time. So fingers crossed they'll, they'll do something and we'll be able to join them and capture the action. The pack seems to be in no rush to get out hunting this afternoon but instead decide to relax and wait out the heat of the day. Mask finds time for a good scratch. Bones keeps a watchful eye on some of the pups, while the others pester Benguela for a playful game. It's mating season, and Ten is doing his best to woo Loop and secure his alpha male status. And it looks like his flirtatious moves are working. The future of Pungwe Pack seems set for at least another generation. Eventually, the dog's hunger gets the better of them, and they move off in search of prey.
we spot a herd of wildebeest, and unusually for them, initiate a hunt. up, a youngster separated from the herd is surrounded by the pack after seeking refuge in the middle of a water pan. The dogs seem intent to retrieve their victim. After several attempts to reach the wildebeest, the pan's water proves too deep for the dogs to handle, and the pack retreats. A lucky escape for the wildebeest on this occasion. The pack find their own secluded waterhole to cool off after the chase. The cool water brings out the pack's frisky side as they frolic and play. Jess uses this opportunity to observe Pungui and the development of the pups. All right, so we've come out this afternoon to have a look at Pungui Pack. Um, there's only seven pups now. So at the end of last year, there were still eight out of the 15. Um, so it's not, I mean, they've actually done quite well up to this point. They're still at just under 50% pup survival. So that's still really good going. Um, generally, when the pups get to about one year of age, you only have 20 or 30% that will actually survive to, to adulthood. So, um, you know, I mean, there's so many things out here that could contribute two pup loss. You know, we've got lions, we've got hyenas, we've got leopard. When they're little, even big birds of prey, big snakes, pythons, anything can take them. And I think also probably for, if there's big litters, um, some of them can just, you know, not be able to feed properly, can maybe lose condition a bit, get left behind, um, just become a bit weak. You know, so it's, it's a bit of a tough world out there, I suppose, but this pack seems to be doing quite well with the puppies that they've got left. They look fat, they look healthy, so we can only hope that going forward, they've got a good pup survival. With the pack's constant movements, it is difficult to pinpoint the exact cause of each death of a pup. So the AWCF team closely monitors the pack's whereabouts in order to keep track of the pup's survival rate. As the sun sets, Neil rejoins Pungui, hopeful that their second attempt at an evening hunt will be more of a success. them already on the prowl and eager for a meal.
Carla spotted. The chase is on. chase, but no luck for Pungui this time. The next morning, the scouts locate the elusive Mapura pack and confirm that two of the dogs are still carrying wire snares. Rosemary acts immediately to dart and remove the snares from the dogs before any further damage is caused. Um, so we've come to try and take um, a couple of snares off the Mapura pack. Um, it's a little bit warm today, so it's not... Not optimal, but we've been trying to find them for a couple of weeks and we haven't had any luck. So one of the injuries is quite bad. We can't afford not to um, take the opportunity while we've got it. So um, we should make up a couple of darts. The dogs are resting maybe 150 meters ahead of us. Um, and we're just going to go in and see if we can try and get a dart, particularly in the, the one with the, um, what looks like a snare around the back leg and there's a, another adult as well with a snare around the neck. Under nicely, his capillary fill is good, he's breathing okay. His blood oxygen is 90, that's fine. Okay, it's obviously been on there a while, but his condition isn't bad at least. Yeah, it's a good thing we got to him now. Um, this is quite a nasty, tight cut, and it's possible he could either lose or at least do permanent damage to his foot. The snare's right in and the tissue's grown over it. Um, so we're gonna have to try and just sort of pull it out. Oh God, poor dog. This should ideally be treated by a vet. Um, this is not... Um, quite what to expect. Um, I didn't realise that they'd all grown in like this. Normally we just take them off. Um, but this is going to require a little bit more than that. Okay, you, you do it because it needs strength. Hold that tight. Okay, and just pull it. Well done. Well done. Okay. So this is what this dog's been carrying in his leg for a while. 
shame. It makes me cross when I see this. All right. Um, can we just spray with water this wound? So all we're going to be able to do is really clean this wound um, as best as possible. Um, and give him a good shot of antibiotics and, and put antibiotic powder on the wound. Uh, and hopefully at least the pain will be reduced there. All right, Kane, I need you to be dribbling this um, drip, this sodium chloride drip on here. Okay, that's perfect. So his oxygen is still 91%, so the immobilization is going fine. I'm just trying to work out if there's any more wire in there, but I don't think so, because you can see it. There was it was at one stage around there, the scarring's all the way around the back. It's amazing here. This dog is not even in, or Botoka is not even in bad condition here, and it's such a testament to the resilience of the species that they can have an injury like this, which must have been incredibly painful, and it's obviously been a fairly long-term injury, and yet he's managed to stay alive, keep up. You know, the scouts have seen him being an active member of the pack, which is phenomenal. And obviously it's also a testament to the social structure of the dogs and the fact that the others will have um, kept feeding him when he was particularly uh, incapacitated or whatever. But, but it's phenomenal. I mean, humans wouldn't put up with this for very long. So please note the time of that reversal as well. So this sort of injury really should be ideally be, look, be looked at by a vet. And I think what we're going to do is, having done what we can, um, obviously keep a close eye on him. And if it doesn't look like he's healing better and the limp is going, then we're going to call a vet to come and um, see if they can do anything. We've got photographs of, of the injury and, and all sort of what's been going on, so should be able to give the good vets a good background if they can do something. The AWCF team pull back and allow the awaiting pack members to rejoin Batoka. Although the wound is deep, the team reacted quickly and efficiently as was needed to prevent any further suffering or risk to the dog's life. While we had um, Batoka down, the rest of the pack stayed just around the corner and there was another individual with a snare around the neck. So we took the opportunity once Batoka had recovered to just quickly put a dart in the other dog. Um, so she's now gone down and we're just gonna go quickly take the snare off. It doesn't look like a complicated um, procedure, so hopefully it should go quite quickly. The team are in no danger at all, as wild dogs do not pose any threat to human beings. All right, Kane, this might need you, your brave, to come and hold her down while I take the snare off. It might. Are you ready? Okay. Amber seems to be only lightly sedated, so the team have to work quickly and quietly. Rosemary creeps up barefoot so as not to disturb the dog. a preemptive ear twitch and freeze. A split second later, Amber is up and away, free from the wire snare. So that was great. She's, she recovered very quickly, um, very easily, um, and has disappeared off in the direction of the rest of the pack, so hopefully we'll join them in time to go hunting. 
Yeah, the problem with snaring is it's such an indiscriminate um, method of trying to catch animals. It's, it's very, very non-specific. It catches many, many non-target species which go through horrific or suffer horrific injuries and aren't utilized by the poachers that are trying to get the meat anyway. Um, and wild dogs really suffer heavily from this and it's such a it's such a scourge you know we did a study over the course of five years and found six and a half thousand animals dead in snares of 19 different species of which the poachers are only actually targeting two or three um, and we've taken off countless i've lost track of how many wild dogs we've had to take off snares this dog was lucky it was a very in fact it wasn't even an injury it was just a loose wire around the neck most of them aren't so lucky they either die in the snare or it cuts in really tight um, and creates a horrible injury around the around the neck. We've seen them cut so tight they go all the way through to the trachea. Um, and it's it's just a problem because there's a there's a real need to, to meet a protein requirement for the communities. I understand that, but this is not it. This this is an indiscriminate and, and very very wasteful method. Over 85 percent of the animals killed in snares are not recovered. They're just not utilised in any way. So. Somewhere there's got to be a better solution. It is essential that the AWCF team monitors all wild dog packs closely so that cases such as this can be resolved as quickly as possible. As the sun sets over the Save Valley, Neil and Kane bike down to join the Splinters pack who are on the prowl for large prey. Spotted and the hunt is on. Wildebeest surround their young to protect them from the pack, but splinters are not standing down. Okay, another phenomenal evening tonight with Splinters Pack. Um, another success for them, another kill. Um, uh, it's, it's pretty late now, as you can probably see, but I mean, that was one of the longest chases we've had with these dogs yet. Um, we've, most of the chases we've noticed have been very sh over, over very short distances, but this one definitely uh, proved that they can, they can wear prey down. Um, this has probably been going for the better part of um, 15 minutes long that chase and uh, they've been feeding for about another 10 now so very little left um, we, we bumped into a herd of wildebeest who uh, as soon as they saw the dogs just ran and uh, that's the trigger as soon as the dogs see prey running they go for it um, and we went across the we ran across the roads we went through thick mapani we went through open acacia we went through river river banks and and sand and uh, amazing long chase um, the herd would stop every so often, um, sort of see off the dogs and then feel the threat was too much and head on. That's probably because there's so many dogs in this pack. Uh, one or two dogs or a smaller pack, they could probably fend off, but, you know, 30 odd dogs is, is not something to be messed with. So, um, bad luck for the wildebeest tonight, but uh, well done to the dogs. Uh, <laughs> we're pretty exhausted and we're going to be riding home in the dark tonight, but uh, well worth it to see that. Absolutely amazing, incredible. A spectacular chase and an incredible evening for Splinters and the camera team.
The next morning, on another part of the conservancy, Rosemary and Jess are called out to attend to a sad and distressing situation. So we've just come up to this trough where yesterday afternoon um, some of the ranch scouts found a couple of wild dog puppies drowned um, and a couple more alive but still in there which they managed to rescue. Um, so we're going to investigate and, and see what we can do maybe to stop it happening again. But you can see right now there's still wild dog tracks all over the place and, and we just got signal. So the pack is still nearby and, and they'll, they'll probably stay around for a couple of days. Um, they, often, they often do stick around when they've lost a member of the pack because they don't necessarily recognise that they're dead and they keep coming back and they keep calling for them. Um, so that's pretty heartbreaking and shame, two little pups. So, I mean, we can't put stuff all the way around, but we can put a couple, maybe if we put a couple of... So we're just discussing, I mean, obviously, we don't know exactly what happened or when the dogs fell in, but it, it's, it, the problem is not that it's so deep, it's that they just couldn't get out again. So we're thinking of putting some of these big rocks that are around in to make some sort of exit route for them. Um, the problem is if they, you know, if they're being called by the pack at one side, they're not necessarily going to go to the other side to find the little bridge, so we're going to have to put two or three. Um, and just hope we can stop it happening again. The problem with these troughs is that they were built in the cattle era, so they're designed for cattle to drink from and they're not remotely wildlife friendly. So we had this happen once last year, it was a different design of trough, but um, the fact that it's happened again, uh, we're going to have to make a proper plan because these, they're, they're just not designed for wildlife. We've seen a number of other things get caught in these troughs as well. Okay, I reckon that should do. Good job. Cool man, let's do one that side. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, um, that should do the job I reckon. We've got one that side, one this side and should be fairly easy for most things to use that to get out. Yeah. Only a few another hundred troughs to go and we're there. <laughs> The man-made water holes around the Conservancy will be watched and modified where possible, so that accidents like this will never happen again. In their attempts to avoid the heat of the day, we find Pongwe taking it easy at a secluded water hole, deep in the Mapani forest. However, they're not alone in the forest today. Approaching a waterhole is another highly endangered African animal and her young calf. These are white rhino. The camera team can't believe their luck. Finding themselves able to film two of the world's rarest animal species in the same place at the same time. The strict anti-poaching efforts of the Save Valley Conservancy make it one of the few remaining areas where high densities of black and white rhino can still be found. In fact, the Conservancy is recording increasing populations of several highly endangered species. Wild dogs and rhino, to name a few. Meetings between the two species appear to be common, as neither one pays much attention to the other. And they are quite happy to share in each other's company for a while. It's only when the wind changes that the mother catches the camera team scent and alerts her youngster that the two depart back into the seclusion of the forest. A very rare and lucky sighting captured by the film crew.
As the day progresses, cameraman Neil joins up with Pungui Pak to try out an unusual filming experiment with the pups. Okay, um, we're with Pungui this afternoon. Kay and our scout managed to track them down and uh, we're hoping we're going to be able to go on an evening hunt with them today. Um, but before we do that, we thought we'd try out a little experiment. Um, the pups are at a, a very curious age now, um, where they're interested in just about everything that, that moves or anything that's unusual to them. So we thought we'd, we'd try out a, a, an unusual filming technique. So what we've done here is we've got a little remote control car and we've attached a little action camera to it. Uh, these things are pretty hardy, so our hope is that if the dogs do get hold of it, they're not going to do too much damage to the camera. I can't say the same for the car. Um, I don't know how it's going to hold up, but we thought we'd drive it around here and see if we can get some interest from the puppies and from the adults and see if we can get some really cool shots of them uh, being entertained by this, and hopefully we'll be entertained too. So let's give it a try and see what happens. Let's put this on the ground and see what they do. Uh, don't forget to press record. <laughs> okay, we've got a bit of interest already. Oh. <laughs> the puppies have given a little bit of a warning call and they're growling. They pretend like they're scared, but they're not scared at all. They're coming. What are you guys thinking? They're getting really brave now. They've forgotten that we're here completely and they're right next to us. Absolutely gobsmacked. They've never seen anything like it, and they're so brave. It's the curiosity of them. Oh, there we go. As I'm sure a lot of you will know if you've got dogs at home, that the fundamental way that they experiment and find out what new things are is just to bite them. So I'm guessing that that's probably what's going to happen here if they do get hold of it. Uh oh. Our vehicle seems to have got stuck a bit. <laughs> they're just not quite sure what to make of it. Some of the other puppies have gone to lie down now, but they're still very interested. Here we go. Else. You're seeing a bit of um, hunting and stalking behavior now from the dog. Oh dear. Oh, oh dear. Oh dear. It'll be interesting to see if we've got any nice footage and perhaps if we bring it out again they'll be um, more interested and uh, more brave next time. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what footage we can get and maybe even with some other species that, that'll be a useful tool going forward. On another part of the conservancy, Jess meets up with Mapora Pack to check up on Batoka and Amber after their snare removals to make sure that they are fit, healthy and fine. Um, okay, so the scouts have found Mapora Pack this morning um, and they're in a really nice spot so we thought it would be a great opportunity to come and just follow up on the dogs that we took snares off 
So you can see Batoka's just above the rest of the dogs there on the, on the rocks. And they're lying in a little bit of mud, so it's a little bit difficult to, to try and assess how well the wound is healing. But we did see him a little bit earlier when we arrived. And he seems to be um, walking really well on the leg, and the swelling's gone down a lot. Um, so yeah, we, I mean, we'll just watch him a bit more today and see how he's doing, but it looks like, like it's healing well. I think what's, what's really rewarding to see is that, you know, because of our, our intense monitoring, we were able to catch the, the dogs with the snares on very early. And it's just fantastic that we can get the snares off and that you can watch the dogs recover. Um, there's, I don't even remember a time where if you find the dogs in time and you can get the snare off, that they don't recover completely. So it's just a really happy day when you can come back and see them together and healthy and the dogs are healing well and and you know that you've you've had a part to play in that dog you know going on and having a happy long life while mapura continued to relax in the mud A few kilometers south, Pungui are up and in hunting formation. Neil and Kane join the hunting party. The pack's intentions are clear as they search for the fresh scent of potential prey. The camera team keep a safe distance back from the lead dogs so as not to interfere with their natural routine. their eye. Tricky riding conditions, but Neil seems to keep up, pushing his bike to the absolute limit. Seconds too late. Neil reaches the pack just as they complete their kill. Wow, okay, an incredible, incredible chase this evening. Um, really, really high speed action. Um, I mean, we were riding flat out to try and keep up with the dogs this evening. I mean, they really were going, going as, about as fast as I think they can go. Um, a very, very interesting chase. We were hunting wildebeest to begin with. Um, the dogs had identified a pair of wildebeest, which they don't normally go for. Um, but for some reason tonight, they thought they were gonna give them a try. And we chased them for probably probably the better part of a kilometre when all of a sudden, I mean, it was amazing. It was like something just, um, a button just sort of went off, a light bulb went off in the dog's heads and they identified an easier target, a lone adult male impala. And their attentions went immediately from the wildebeest to the impala and the wildebeest chase was over and they were onto this impala. And the impala, very sort of un un unsuspecting, obviously just got 
just got surprised by the dogs and they obviously just launched on him here in this thicket. Um, and, but, but I mean, what an, what an amazing chase. Uh, this is probably the fastest I think we've recorded the dogs going. I mean, we were probably must have been close to about 60 k's an hour there over those long straights. Um, so quite incredible action and uh, again, another success for the dogs. Um, well done to them. Coming up in the next episode, a resident baboon on one of the ranches requires some human help. The splinters pack run into something unfamiliar. Jess checks in on the splinters pups. Pongui are on the hunt for big game. and splinters once again demonstrate their extraordinary hunting tactics. The African wild dog is considered to be Africa's most efficient and successful hunter. With a population of only around 6,500 individuals, or 660 packs, it is also Southern Africa's most rare large carnivore. However, organizations like the African Wildlife Conservation Fund, AWCF, are on a mission to guarantee the survival of this inspiring species. Through their efforts, these dogs, once verging on the brink of local extinction, are making a comeback. It's an incredible experience, something I'll never forget. Wow, this is so special. So we've arrived at the day. Previously on Wild Dogs Chasing Tales, Rosemary caught up with the Conservancy's rarest large carnivore. Pungui were waist deep in a wildebeest hunt. Denning season has started. Pungui came close to grabbing another impala. Rosemary dealt with a shocking snare removal. The pups were intrigued by an unusual toy. And Splinters took on another herd of wildebeest. Coming up in this episode, a resident baboon on one of the ranches requires some human help. The Splinters pack run into something unfamiliar. Jess visits the newborn Splinters pups. Pungui are on the hunt for big game. Splinters once again demonstrate their extraordinary hunting tactics. It's early morning, and Jess and Rosemary have been called to the south of the Conservancy to dart and remove a snare from a well-known resident baboon. Luckily, the baboon has been coaxed into an enclosure, making it manageable to dart this highly intelligent species. Um, so we're just, um, there's a baboon very, very badly injured by a snare. So we're just gonna um, see if we can dart it and take the snare off. The guys have managed to enclose it in a small garage area um, with wire mesh around, which is ideal because it's very, very difficult to free dart baboons. And 
and and not very safe because if they book off up a tree or something it can be a problem so this is a really good situation but i've never darted baboon before um and i'm not quite sure how it's going to work but but the the injury is really bad so hopefully we can at least do something to help it okay that's one Uh, so Dartia Baboon is um, very different to anything we've done before. Um, it, it, they just react very differently. There's different combinations of drugs or at least dosages. Um, obviously, being a primate, the disease transmission issue is a bit more um, possible or likely than other animals, so we'll obviously be wearing gloves. Um, I think that, that we're just a little bit nervous because we don't know how that's going to react. Mm. Um, I'm not sure. I'm just going to have to, to look. Hi. You don't mind me being here, do you? No, he's very low back. <coughs> okay. All right. All right. Yogi, Yogi. Fine. Fine. All right, my boy. All right, Yogi. Well done, boy. Thank you, Rex. All right, All right Yogi. No, it's fine here. Yeah, it's cool here. Yeah. Um. Can you get the dot out? Thanks. Yeah. What we need is this fresh tissue so it can heal itself because this necrotic tissue won't just keep spraying a bit in there. doesn't look too bad it hasn't I mean it's pretty horrific but it hasn't cut through any it hasn't cut too deep it hasn't cut into anywhere that's going to cause a problem so um, he should heal just fine once we've cleaned things up and given him some <coughs> antibiotics and cleaned this wound nicely okay, thank the wound is thoroughly cleaned and treated so it does not get infected once the baboon is released back into the wild <laughs> You're going to be the laughing stock of your friends, Mr. Mr. Yogi. If he's going to wake up, he doesn't need the reversal. If he stays down, I'll come back in and give it to him. But let's all move out. So just leave, leave the blindfold on. Just leave him. Just do it quickly. Well done, and come out. As soon as his eyes are open, come out. Yeah, well done. It's recovering nicely. Yeah, but it's good if he knows you and you're familiar to him. Oh, well done. That's nice. Good recovery. Stretch it out, stretch it out. A bit wobbly still with so straight, straight to food. <laughs> food. Cool. What that a good sign. Really oh my God, what a perfect what recovery. A yeah, so that actually went a whole lot better than we could have hoped for, actually. Like I said, first time we've ever done baboons, didn't really know what to expect, weren't quite sure that we were doing things right, but the dart went in really nicely and he went down fairly quickly we managed to get the snare off here it is evil thing fortunately the wound isn't too bad which is really nice to see because it's horrible to put an animal down and then realize it's actually beyond your help so all it needed was a bit of cleaning the wound and um, and then he started moving a bit so we just pulled back and gave him the space to recover um, Jess gave him the reversal and and he's now up and he, he actually had a fantastic recovery he just you know, sort of slowly got out. Very human. Yeah, yeah, very human. Did you see him? It's like, oh, I've got an addict. And then came over and started eating, which is about as good as you get. So it seems like, I mean, you'll keep an eye on him, but, yeah. but it seems like it all went really well. Yogi is fit and fine. An all-round success for everyone involved. <laughs> Back up in the north of the Save Valley, 
Neil and Kane are tracking the Splinters pack on their morning hunt. Intrigued, as are the cheetah. Both species ranking at the bottom of the large carnivore pecking order are an equal match, and little aggression is shown to one another in this chance meeting. Okay, another phenomenal sighting this morning with the dogs. Uh, we're with Splinters Pack hunting this morning and um, we came across unbelievably a group of at least three cheetah. But what was more interesting was, was watching the sort of the, the, the two parties coming together to uh, sort of colliding. Uh, both cheetah and wild dog are both very low ranked animals um, in the pecking order of large carnivores. They're right at the bottom. So it was very interesting to watch what would happen. I mean, cheetah are slightly bigger, um, have the advantage of speed on their side. The dogs obviously have the have the strength in numbers uh, but the whole affair was rather civil they kind of you know got in each other's faces a little bit uh, there was a bit of snarling and growling and spitting but uh, in the end uh, the, both both sort of both parties respected each other they kind of you know gauged each other up the dogs went their way um, and the cheetahs went theirs but what an incredible sighting out this you know not many people are fortunate enough to see that so we think we're very lucky this morning the dogs are now resting off on the Mopani now, probably going to spend the rest of the day there, but we'll come back this evening, join them on the hunt, and uh, who knows what we'll run into next. A once-in-a-lifetime sighting, witnessing Southern Africa's two most rare large carnivores in the same place at the same time. The next morning, Jess heads out to visit the Splinter's Den in the hope of seeing the new pups out and about. There is much activity at the den, with pups playing and adults socialising after returning from an early hunt. Okay, so this morning we've come out to Splinter's Den um, and it's really exciting for me because it's the first time that I'm back here in the new year and after being away for a bit over December and it's fantastic because the puppies are sort of two months and a bit and they are at the stage where they're big and they're playing so it's fantastic for me to, to come and see them and see how much they've grown and we've still got 10 healthy puppies and what's really nice to see is they've got beautiful patterns. From when they're very little, they only have the black and white. And as the puppies start to get a little bit older, do they start developing the tan shades and mixes. So these puppies are really beautifully marked. And um, I know what the previous, well, what the alpha male Batman looks like. And he's a bit of a dull dud. So <laughs> um, if, I was, if I was him, I'd be asking a few questions, especially considering that this is such a a very, you know, well, it's a very weird time of the year for the dogs to be denning. I think, as we've sort of said before, they typically den for three months in the middle of the year, so sometime between May to August. And this pack started denning again in December, so just before the end of last year. And 
it's it's just really really bizarre and it's it's the first time for the for the project um for this to happen and as far as we can tell we still need to do some more research and look into it but speaking to colleagues and and reading up on it thus far it's the first time that a lot of people have heard of this happening so it's a really interesting um event for us it's a really interesting thing ecologically and in terms of african wild dogs and their breeding behavior so we as we said we're going to be watching intently we really monitoring it well trying to collect as much data as we can and then we'll just see how it goes and, and you know see how well they fare and especially see what happens when the normal denning season comes up this year which this pack is normally one of our earliest denning season de denning packs so they would normally start denning in may already again so we'll see what happens the, one of the other things that I, I spotted when, when we came in here was that there are one or two, so most of the adults are centered around the den with the puppies, but there are one or two that are just a little bit further out. And you can obviously see that this vegetation for the den is quite thick. Um, the mapani is, you know, quite dense mapani. So, you know, my thinking is maybe that this kind of environment is good in some ways and bad in others. Good that perhaps with the thicker vegetation, the, that very unique smell of the dogs is, is muffled somewhat, as would be the sounds. So you've heard how vocal they can be, especially this time of morning when they're playing or feeding. Um, so perhaps the thicker vegetation could help to muffle that um, and obviously hide their location a little bit. But likewise, they will be vulnerable to potentially dangerous predators like lion or hyena that might, might get whiffed of them further off and then sort of try and creep in and see what's going on. And so maybe those one or two that are dots around the periphery are just, you know, acting sort of lookouts and will obviously stand up and bark or alarm call if there's something that the rest of the pack needs to be alerted to. down, Neil and Kane head out to meet up with the Pungui pack, who are already on the move and in search for prey. long before wildebeest are spotted and the hunt shifts up a gear. For the first time ever, we capture the Pungui pups taking a lead role in a hunt. They can now be considered full contributing members of the PAX hunting party. The herd splits, and the dogs manage to successfully separate an adult and two youngsters. young wildebeest and quickly subdues the animal. A substantial meal for Pungui tonight. Another amazing evening with the dogs. Uh, we're with Pungui Pack tonight, um, and they've decided they're going to hunt wildebeest now. Up till this point, um, we've predominantly seen them making, uh, hunting and making kills on Impala, but uh, today they've decided they're going to up their game a little bit, and they're, they're going for wildebeest now, and with great success. Um, they managed to separate two youngsters from the herd, 
and um, they actually managed to, to catch up to the youngster at one point and, and pin him down, but the two of the adults from the wildebeest came back, charged the dogs. I actually saw one dog on the ground at one point who uh, hopefully is okay, but um, yeah, well, I mean, once they catch up to the herd and they've separated a youngster like that, it's, it's normally tickets for that, for that um, young wildebeest. So um, the dogs have to eat and they've got a, a good meal which will last them at least until tomorrow. They won't have to hunt again and uh, some incredible footage. Wow, um, high speed, high speed action tonight. It's uh, very noticeable now that um, the pups have matured and, and grown up and they're now reached adult status because um, what, we, what we often used to see in the beginning and what we've been seeing with the splinters puppies is that they always have preferential treatment and, the, and they always have the first go at the carcass once they're there. Um, any puppies that arrive, the adults leave it and, and the puppies are the priority. That's not the case now at all. Um, the, the, they, they feed as a pack now and it's kind of first come first serve and whoever can eat their fill in the quickest time does so. Um, and if you don't get a look in, well that's tough luck for you I'm afraid. Um, so another unbelievable evening for us with the dogs and yet another successful hunt and a successful kill. Um, they're all going to sleep well tonight, so will we. Um, we're pretty exhausted from that long chase. Um, I guess we'll just leave the dogs and their usual dinner guests, the jackals, to finish off this carcass and we'll link up with them again tomorrow. The Salve Valley Conservancy is as magnificent as it is vast. Providing countless different landscapes and habitats for so many special species of flora and fauna to flourish and succeed. The growth of the wild dog population here, as well as many other endangered species, is a great testament to conservation in Africa. In the north of the Conservancy, Rosemary is on her way to try and attempt to put a collar on Splinter's pack in order to track their movements. Okay, we've located the dogs um, this morning. Um, it's really nice and early, so it's still cool. They're about a kilometre um, ahead of us. And so we're going to try and, and get a collar on. Um, it's a perfect time for it. I haven't yet seen the pack. Ruben found them this morning. Um, but assuming that, that they're in an accessible location, then conditions look good for trying to get a collar on. All right, wish us luck. Michaela dart in? Yep, copy. Okay, so the dart's in, um, the dog's showing signs, so we're just going to give him four or five minutes to um, go down completely before we approach. Ruben, please find the thermometer. I don't know if it's back there or there. And this is a satellite collar. Um, this is one of the biggest males in the pack, and we only put these slightly bigger collars on the big males. So um, it's great to have had that opportunity, and it's going to give us fantastic information about where where the pack is moving. 
With two dogs successfully sedated and the situation under control, the team fit both with tracking collars. So the reason we're taking blood is so that we can um, uh, use it for various genetic analyses, also uh, blood parasite levels and disease screening of various um, things, including rabies, can under stemper, even previous exposure to those diseases. So his teeth are in very good condition. Um, he's a fully grown man. He's actually a really nice big dog, um, but his teeth are still in really good condition. We've just got some ice packs, uh, ice packs here to um, keep him cool. Temperature's okay, but it, even though it's uh, in about half past seven in the morning, it's still quite warm, so it's cool. Um, so I'm just doing some measurements here. So girth, 64. This guy's been down nearly an hour. He's not yet showing any signs of independent movement, but as soon as he does, as soon as he flicks an ear or a tail, which we'd expect to be fairly soon, um, indicating that the ketamine has worn off, then we'll give him an antidote um, to reverse the metatomidine, which is a sedative, and then he should have a very, um, or as good as possible, kind of relaxed wake up from this immobilization event. Um, so I'm just going to prepare that now. And I'm also going to give him a jab of penicillin. It's just sort of standard practice, you know, we did create a uh, small penetration wound with the dart um, and even though he's most likely not going to suffer any ill effects from that whatsoever um, we just give a small shot of long-acting penicillin Rosemary notices the first signs of independent movement and administers the sedative reversal drug. I do it all into the muscle. Um, some people do it half into the vein, half into the muscle. I find they get up way too quickly if you do that. And then they, you know, they're not, they've still got a bit of ketamine in their legs and it's not such a smooth recovery. So although it means we wait a little bit longer, Seems better for the dog if it's all intramuscular. Okay, so we'll just back off and move the kit away. Guys, can we clear the kit? With two dogs successfully collared, AWCF are now able to easily monitor the movements of the pack. Yeah, well, that's a really nice recovery. She did well. He did well. Fitting the tracking collars to young males can be beneficial, as they may at some point split off from their natal pack. Monitoring the dispersing males will allow the AWCF team to discover newly formed packs in and around the Conservancy. Back at the AWCF headquarters, Jess and Neil get together to discuss some of the hunting patterns Neil has noted while filming the series. Okay, so we're at the Wild Dog HQ today. Um, we've brought some of our findings, some of the footage that we've recorded of the dogs hunting to show Jess and uh, just get her opinion and, and see what she thinks. So um, Jess, one of the first clips that we're going to show you here yeah. is a, a, a hunt of punguis, um, okay. a successful hunt where they managed to take down an impala and I'll, I'll just bring through it slowly so you can I mean, just have a look and see you know, the tactics and the, the way the dogs work. Yeah. Um, you can see the impala coming in there. Oh, it yeah. actually jumps right <laughs> over one of the dogs' backs. Um, I mean, at, at this stage of the hunt, would you say that the dogs are, are communicating with each other or...? You, you know, from what I've seen and, and you know, from what mm -hmm. I've watched as well, it's... Look, the dogs are, I think, they're incredibly opportunistic and they're obviously very agile um, and successful hunters. I think there are one or two key leaders that can often instigate it That's, yeah. and the rest of the pack will follow. As soon as something runs, it becomes prey and yeah. they're onto it. Yeah. 
Um, if we frame a bit further through, here's a, here's a, a launch by one of the dogs actually almost onto the onto the impala's back, but he manages yeah. to get away. Um, uh, got it by its tail, got back it leg. By the, by the back leg. Yeah. And the other dogs were moving in to try and block block its escape. Yeah. And then very interesting here. Yeah. yeah. You now see. That's yeah. That's the interesting part. Yeah. So that's. I mean, when you when you read any liter literature and stories and, and things of wild dog hunting stories, they always say, and a lot of people believe it. That's what dogs do. That they well, they do. They get hold of their prey, and a lot of the time they will just start disemboweling it mm. um, and eating it alive. But the they also do very much use that typical cat strangulation hold. They can often suffocate their prey yeah. long before they start yeah. eating on it. So this, for me, was one of the most interesting things that we managed to pick up, that dogs mm -hmm. actually do go for the strangulation hold. But is this the only time you saw them doing it? or um, this is the the other hunts? I think this is one of the only times we saw it so openly like obviously, this. I mean, yeah. Obviously, when you've got 10 to 12, 20 dogs, it's hard to see exactly, to see where, exactly they... where they all are. Yeah. But I mean, generally, the dogs know that the, the, weak, that the weak spot is in the belly, yeah, and yeah. that's normally how they kill the prey. Yeah. But it, from what we saw, I mean, I don't think I saw any animal suffer for probably more than about mm. a minute. It you... was very fast, quick kill. It... The dogs seem to get a lot of bad publicity yeah. about being um, ruthless, brutal killers that sort of eat their prey alive. I mean, <laughs> yeah. look, this proves that they don't necessarily always do that. But what's more is that from what we noticed on all of the hunts that we we were on, even big game like, you know, sub-adult wildebeest, which is yeah. a big animal for the dogs to take down, um, the kills were, were very quick, very efficient. I mean, with that many dogs, um, th most of the kills were over probably within a minute. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think for most of that minute, the animal's got so much adrenaline rushing through it. Yeah, absolutely. It more or less doesn't feel yeah. like what's going on. And often dogs, I mean, dogs do, they kill their prey a lot quicker than... I mean, I've seen a female lioness take down a wildebeest and she did this normal suffocation and it took easily 15, 20 minutes for yeah, a wildebeest yeah. to die. And very often they'll actually eat their prey alive very slowly, whereas the dogs don't eat slowly at all. No. They just, <laughs> they just munch. And yeah. I mean, the, the carcass is, is, I mean, I say the kill probably takes less than a minute. The carcass is more or less yeah, exactly. stripped in probably three to four minutes. Yes, I exactly. Mean, and and there's, you can hardly even tell what they're eating yeah. at that stage. Yeah. So, I mean, they are yeah. incredibly efficient at what they do and, and incredible animals to watch. There's no, nothing absolutely. like them. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Phenomenal. Well, anyway, we'll hopefully get a few more hunts and we'll be able yeah. to show you a couple more and get your analysis. Great. Uh, I mean, yeah, this is fantastic because the dogs operate so quickly to be able to catch them, catch the whole, you know, sequence happening is really quite amazing mm, to see. Mm. Yeah. yeah well, often you'll, you'll often you'll be on them and you'll be with them chasing, but you cannot keep up. They just go too quickly. And yeah. then by the time you get to them, it's and they're, it's, they're the animals down, and it's it's a head left and it's and fat <laughs> and the spine exactly. <laughs> well, anyway, yeah, yeah. hopefully you'll have a few more, and um, great. You guys will be able to study a bit more of how we'll learn a bit more about how these guys actually go about their their business. Yeah, and also interesting to see what other animals they select and take mm. down. That's yeah. for sure. With very few full wild dog hunts caught on film, this material should prove to be very useful for any future research on wild dog hunting behaviour. Before the sun sets, Neil heads out with Kane to meet up with Splinter's pack in the east of the Conservancy to catch them on their evening hunt. Buffalo are spotted in the distance and extraordinarily, the pack goes after the herd. This is a first. The pack catches up with the youngster lagging behind, but the herd turned to fend the dogs off. Threatened, older, more mature buffalo will flank out from the herd, hiding behind trees and bushes to ambush any unsuspecting adversaries following in their wake. High risk hunting for both the dogs and the camera crew.
buffalo is too big for these dogs. Yeah, it's not for us. <laughs> the herd is too large and hyper aggressive. The pack sensibly retreats and continues their hunt in the opposite direction. It's not long before the dogs clearly see something and begin alerting one another. This behavior is most often associated with the presence of another predator. Neil approaches cautiously in the fading light and catches a glance of a fleeting cheetah as it abandons a recently made kill. One cheetah is no match for 32 dogs. Phenomenally, yet another wild dog cheetah encounter. Wow, what a phenomenal evening this evening. Uh, I'm quite blown away actually by everything we've seen. Um, the splinters pack seem to be breaking all the rules at the moment, um, having puppies at weird times of the year and, uh, and now they're hunting buffalo, it seems. Um, dogs are not known to, to hunt buffalo. They're, they're, they're far too big of a prey for, for wild dogs to take on. However, Kane did actually find them this morning feeding on a, a, a very young buffalo. So they proved that they can do it, and obviously they're confident enough to take on a whole herd of buffalo. And as the hunt progressed, obviously they, they, they failed with the buffalo and they, they carried on searching. Um, it was probably about another 20 minutes before I heard the dogs making their warning call. The dogs were bouncing in the air, and as I approached in, I could see something in the bushes, and it was on a kill. So we, we, we gently moved in to see what it was, and uh, it didn't seem too concerned at first, and then all of a sudden, maybe it, it felt like the dogs were surrounding it, and it was outnumbered. It jumped up in the air, and it was a cheetah. The dogs, not being one to miss out on a free meal, jumped onto the carcass and finished it off in seconds. So we've proved two things today. Wild dogs will scavenge at times, even though they're not known to be scavengers, and they can take down buffalo. <laughs> What an evening, what a night. The next morning, using the newly fitted telemetry, Rosemary is able to track down the splinters pack and make sure all is well with Tanganda and Bemba, the recently collared males. Okay, so um, we've just come to the splinters pack den. Yesterday we managed to f put collars on two of the adult males, Tanganda and Bemba. Um, they both, the, the immobilizations went really well and they recovered really nicely, but we always check the following day that they've reunited with the pack um, and that they're both, they're both doing well, no complications. So the pack's just come back and I can see both dogs. I've just seen them, so I think, yeah, they're clearly both there looking absolutely happy, integrated back into the pack, no, no obvious cause for concern whatsoever, which is what we would expect, but it's just always nice to confirm. So you can see that Bemba is a really big male. We wouldn't only ever fit those um, satellite collars onto, onto big adult male dogs. They, they're not too heavy. They're definitely within ethical weight limits for dogs, but um, nonetheless, they are quite big and bulky. And we've, we've chosen Bemba specifically because he is the biggest adult male in the pack. And as you can see, he's, he's not impacted by it. Given that we've, we've sort of recorded absolutely no negative impact of these collars, the value of the information we can get from the collars and the way we can use that information really far outweighs any, any potential negative impact. And, and I mean, things like if they go out of the conservancy, for example, we, can, we, we know that they're doing that. We can go into those communities, talk to people about the dogs, 
make them aware that they're around and, and advise them how to look after their livestock to prevent conflict because the dogs do go outside, they do get into conflict with livestock farmers and they do get killed. And if we can prevent that because we've got a collar data telling us where they are so we can forewarn communities, then then that's hugely valuable and is actually saving saving the pack. Um, likewise, if we notice they've picked up a number of snares, we can look at the information, where have they been, and we can target that area. We can send anti-poaching units into that area to do snare sweeps. Um, again, saving lives and, and hopefully preventing further injuries. It helps us oh, in a huge number of ways. We can get better mortality data. We can find the dens much sooner. We can record the pup emergence. You know, otherwise, we may miss it if we can't, can't locate the dogs. So tremendous benefit um, to having these collars on them. Um, and another area where they can be very, very uh, useful is if, if the dog that's wearing that, that collar disperses. And in some areas, we focus our collaring, particularly on males of the sort of one and a half to two year old that are quite likely to disperse. And if a satellite collared dog does disperse, it's absolutely incredible. It provides such valuable data about the way they use the landscape when they're out of their protected areas. So the way they move through these human dominated landscapes or between pockets of protected areas. And it's that sort of information is it's hard to put a price on that because all our work is about trying to ensure connectivity and safe dispersal for these dogs. And if if we know what they're doing and how they're using the landscape, which we do from these collars, um, then we, we're way ahead of the game when we're trying to, to make effective uh, corridors and connectivity areas. So huge value in having these collars on and, and well worth it. The telemetry collars are a huge asset to the AWCF Scout, as it allows them to monitor and track the pack's movements as efficiently as possible. Later that day, Neil and Kane are at it again. They've located Pungui Pack in a good hunting area and meet up with the dogs who are already on the move. All of a sudden, the pack take off in a new direction led by Jigsaw. They don't seem to be hunting, but the camera crew follow anyway. Jigsaw seems to be leading them to something. A kill. Extraordinarily, it seems as though Jigsaw at some point split from the pack and managed to kill an adult male impala, all by herself, without any assistance. Once down, she relocated the pack and led them to the kill to share in her success. As the series winds to an end, Jess, Rosemary and Kane link up with Pungui to discuss the Conservancy's resident packs, their actions over the last six months, and the future of wild dogs in the Save Valley. So yeah, it's nearly denning season again, start of denning season actually for some packs and we're starting to noting, notice signs of pregnancy, um, which is really exciting. And if I think, you know, if we think back to Pungui, you know, these guys over here, just last year they were a brand new pack. They yeah. weren't even, they didn't even exist. And then they had 15 pups, which is just amazing. Yeah. And it's a shame as well. I mean, it's, it's kind of the usual thing, but they've only got um, six out of their 15 pups left, mm. okay? Yes. Just mm. six, yeah. So that's the survival rate of, what, 40% um, to almost a year, which is lower than average. I think our average is, what? Six, about 62%. 62% at the moment. So 40%. It's not bad for a first-time pack. It's not bad for, mm. you know, dogs that have, first of all, only just formed a pack and also first-time alpha females. Um, and 15 was a very big litter for them to cope with. So yeah. still having six is not too bad. Mm -mm. I wonder it's going to be interesting to see. I think it's clearly loop that's becoming the alpha female. We, were, we weren't sure at the beginning because there were two females that were both uh, showed signs of pregnancy and both heavily lactating and then they had this big litter. So we suspect maybe both of the um, 
females had pups. So we're, we're pretty sure that, that Loop now is the alpha female. She's very much assuming the behaviour of the alpha female, but we're still not totally sure who the alpha male is because mm. she's been behaving a bit oddly, hasn't yeah. she? Yeah, so she's been seen um, pairing off with three of the males, so Ten and Benguela um, and Mask. So, yeah, we, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. But we've been watching these sort of different episodes happen um, and obviously just closely monitoring and we'll just try to pick up what's, exactly what's going on there. Yeah, it's just really exciting to, to think another denning season's about to start just around the corner. And I guess that's for all of them. Splinters, can you believe it? <laughs> um, v, who's the, <coughs> the alpha female that had pups last May, had pups again in December, is now pregnant again. So that just rounds it off. It wasn't, you know, kind of really super early denning event or something. It was just this extra... Yeah. Insanely random. I mean, Kane, you, I mean, 100% that female. 100%. 100%. 100%. (laughs) So the same female, Den May last year, Den December, we've we've watched her in December. She still had five surviving pups from her first litter, produced another 10 pups. All 10 are still surviving. And she's, um, and yeah, yeah, she's pregnant again. um, That pack at the moment is quite a, quite a force at at 32 dogs. Yeah, no, they're great. Actually unbelievable. 17 adults, four big pups, and 10 little pups. Yeah. So they're a strong pack going into the denning season. If they have another litter of 10 or something, mm. they're going to be great. They're going to reach yeah. the highest we've ever recorded in the Conservancy is 42. So They're in the runnings. They're in the <laughs> runnings, yeah. <laughs> sure. And the alpha male of that pack is also slightly contentious at the moment yeah. because... Um, what's he called? Batman. Batman. Who we thought it was is, is missing at the moment. Mm. So... Kane is saying that he saw the, the three-legged dog, old Hopalong, <laughs> mating um, v. v. So that could be an interesting turn up for the books if it's the, if it's the three-legged guy that's, that's taking alpha yeah. male status. It'll be very interesting to see. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, she's, so she's looking fairly fat, ready to den, probably within the next three, three weeks. Yeah, they always, um, well, normally the one of the earliest, they always, for the last two years, they've been the first den um, that we found of the season. So, Kane, obviously um, you've been doing a lot more, um, spending a lot more time with the dogs while they've been hunting. Yes. How's that been going? It's quite interesting. We don't, unfortunately, get the privilege of doing that very often. Mm. So, Kane's been having a lot of interesting experiences. What, what's been going on? Uh, mostly when you're hunting with the Pungwe, they, they spend their time hunting in Bala. In Palas. In Palas, yeah. But uh, when most of the time when they're hunting with the Splinters, they're catching up. Mostly on kudus, okay. will be best. Sure. Yeah. If the splinters catch up on Imbala, they c- could kill five or six. Yo, or don't tell the ranch. <laughs> yeah, don't tell anyone else there. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, they're a big they're pack, big so, so that's good. Are they using, when they catch the um, kudu and wildebeest, are they all, all together rather yes. than splitting up? Yes. Yeah, so using their yes. numbers to catch bigger yeah. prey. Yes. That's really, you see, we spend our lives in the office doing the, the raising funds and all the admin that goes with these sort of projects, and, and Kane gets the good job. What happened? The Pungui pack remains formidable, and with more pups on the way, will soon be a force to be reckoned with. Of the 15 pups Pungui started with, five have survived to adulthood. Bandit, Bluff, Blackjack, Chips and Poker. In the subsequent denning season, amazingly, the three original females, Loop, Jigsaw and Bones, each gave birth to their own litter of puppies. A total of 19 pups to continue the Pongui legacy. With the series coming to an end, we look back on the incredible footage captured over the last few months and the unbelievable behavior that's been witnessed. From the first emergence of the Pongwe pups to the first takedown captured on film. Showcasing some amazing wild dog behavior and spectacular hunting scenes. I can't ride, well, let's go, let's go, let's go. Riding along, witnessing heart-stopping moments 
and breathtaking scenery. This series has been packed with adrenaline, exhilaration, and determination. AWCF continue to research and conserve the African wild dog.